Crimes. Skull Point Alliance Book 2. By Emery Cole. Chapter 1. Rissa. Rissa Belgrande hoped the woman coming out of the casino wasn't the kind to pay attention to her surroundings. The woman's name was Angelina, and not losing sight of her was of utmost importance to Rissa. And not just for professional reasons. There were a lot of cars and people in the parking lot, especially for early morning. The fact Rissa worried was a shout out to her training. But then again, 10 years at the New Orleans Police Department could do that to a person. Angelina got into the back of a yellow cab, and Rissa nosed her sedan out of its parking spot, ready to follow. The cab turned onto the street in front of the casino, then headed south. Surprising since only industrial warehousing and the waterfront were that way. Who knew what the rich did? Or why? Well, since Angelina was merely the girlfriend of the casino owner, she probably wasn't rich. Rissa could see Angelina as a dancer or a waitress who'd caught the billionaire's eye. Angelina could be booted out the door tomorrow. That's what worried Rissa so much, how quickly things could change, and no one would be aware that anything had happened. And as far as that went, it was precisely what she was getting from the casino management, denial. The disappearance of Rissa's best friend didn't happen at their establishment. Couldn't happen at their establishment. Or so they claimed. Even though that was the last place Kiva was seen. A couple weeks ago, Kiva texted Rissa from the casino that she'd won big at one of the slots and they'd go out and celebrate when Rissa got off work. That was the last time Rissa heard from her. As part of the New Orleans Police Department, Rissa had resources and options few others had access to. And what she found out about Jeffers Lupin and Frank Bonaparte, casino co-owners, set off her alarms. She had little doubt something was going on at the casino, and she was just the one to figure it out. In front of Rissa, the cab slowed and pulled into a small marina. Odd, it was the same marina where a shooting happened not long ago. Rissa remembered that call vividly. When she had arrived on the scene, nobody was around. No one with a gun, no victim, no body, no nothing. Being here twice in as many weeks gave Rissa pause. Coincidence? She didn't believe in coincidences. Rissa pulled into a spot in the lot where she could keep an eye on the boats and the dock area. She slunk down into her seat and watched. Angelina got out of the cab and hurried down to a boat called Enchantment. There a man took her bag and tossed it on the seat, then they walked up the pier toward the parking lot. Rissa eyed the man as they strolled up the asphalt toward the road. For all that was holy, this guy was gorgeous. Was Angelina two-timing her boyfriend casino owner? For the man sake, she hoped not. He probably wouldn't be around much longer if that was the case. She wouldn't be surprised if she got a call to check out a floater, and it turned out to be the hunk's body. Just then, suddenly, he turned and looked in her direction. Rissa scrunched down in her car seat. She wondered where they were going. Into public wasn't the best idea if they were secret lovers. She rolled the window down a couple inches to see if she could hear what they were talking about. Her hearing had always been exceptional. When she was little, she heard everything the others said about her, even if her back was turned or if she was in the other room. The couple prattled on about some place. Nothing that seemed important. When the two reached the sidewalk along the street, Rissa stepped out of the car and watched them go into small cafe a couple doors down. Rissa knew that place had the best gumbo in existence. If they were going to sit and eat, then she'd have time to snoop around the boat. She hurried down the parking lot onto the pier and out to the vessel. Snooping was exactly what she planned to do. She took a deep breath before she jumped on board. Boats. Water. She hated boats and water. The small ship was very clean and tidy. Well maintained. She opened cabinet doors and rooted through boxes. She found little that was helpful. Weren't boat people supposed to keep certain information on board? Sort of like cars had to have registration? She knew little about anything that had to do with water. She couldn't even swim. 
Her mother had a childhood accident that left Rissa terrified of anything bigger than a puddle. Thus, Rissa's summertime activities growing up were far from any beach or other water bodies. She pulled up the rear bench seat cushions and stared at life jackets and rope that hardly took up any space. Everything was neat and tidy. Not even a cobweb in the far corner. Damn. Snooping around this boat had been a bust. Footfalls on wooden pier snapped her head around. Angelina and the man were coming down the aisle. He held a plastic bag which his nose was buried in. She was bound to get caught. Damn. The couple was close enough to surely see her climb out of the boat if she left the way she came aboard. She looked for a back exit. Other than diving into the water, no luck there. And that wasn't happening. Maybe she could pretend to be marina security and say she was searching his boat for drugs, stolen goods. But then Angelina would see her face and her cover at the casinos would be blown. No way was she jeopardizing her mission on finding her best friend. Could she hide somewhere? The seat cushion for the bench was still up. She looked at the storage space. It was wide and long enough for her to lie in. But where were they going? It had to be someone's house along the shoreline, since there was nowhere else they could go. Right. She needed to decide, the two were almost to the boat. Decision made, she climbed into the storage bin and pulled the seat cushion down. When they got to where they were going, she'd sneak out and Uber her way back to the city. What a pain in the ass situation she'd gotten herself into now. Chapter 2 Maze Maze pulled the boat into the mainland harbor and tied up. He wanted to get here a bit earlier to have a bowl of gumbo from Sarah's cafe before Angelina showed to go to the island, but that never seemed to work out. He didn't get many chances to come to the mainland, but when he did, he stopped by the little cafe. After setting the side bumpers, the sound of crunching gravel told him someone was driving down to the pier. He looked up to see a cab making its way down the drive, and a sedan heading toward the far corner. Angelina popped out of the cab and hurried toward the boat. Crud. Maybe she'd be okay with accompanying him to the diner to get a to-go bowl of ambrosia. Hi Maze, she waved and called out. The breeze blowing in his face brought her heavy perfume. How she could stand that day in and day out baffled him. Especially as she was also a shifter. His nose would go dead within an hour. Maybe that's what happened when living in the city. All the people, traffic and trash were too much for him. He preferred the island environment where the forest was fresh and the beach air clean. No cars or buses to choke your breath with pollution and no human waste floating in gutters. A chill raced down his back in disgust. He didn't know how Angelina could stand living here, amongst all this humanity. Hey Angelina. Good to see you again. Maze took her bag. Yeah. I can't wait to see the fam, she said. It's been a while. He set the bag in the boat, then turned to her. Would you mind going to the cafe with me to order some gumbo before we left? I have to get it when I can. I wouldn't mind at all. Sarah has the best Cajun food in town. Jeff has her delivered to the club for meetings all the time. Maze sneered. Jeff, her boyfriend, co-owner of the busiest casino around. He'd never met the man, but if he had his say, he wouldn't let Angelina date the man. But her business was none of his own. She wasn't his family. But if the man ever stepped out of line with Angelina, then as a security shifter for the island, he had a right to get involved to take care of his people. Whether they were on the island or mainland. Mays climbed from the boat to the pier, and they headed up the dock toward the street. Angelina asked, how's the island doing without Mrs. Devereaux? Tears choked her words. I'm still not over losing the wonderful woman. How could anyone want to kill her? Maze put an arm around her shoulders as they walked. The police are working on finding the killers. We just have to be patient and let them do their job. He hoped she didn't smell his flat-out lie. With the blowing breeze and her strong perfume, how could she smell anything? Why did he lie? Because Quick made the decision to keep Adriana's killing quiet until he had a chance to investigate. 
They both knew Adriana hadn't been the target. Quick had been. She just got in the way and saved his life. Maze was fortunate it was only Quick was being hunted. As Quick's best friend when they were younger, Maze was there when Quick tried to stop his father from killing his mom in a blind rage of anger. Quick was unsuccessful at stopping the bastard in time from killing Quick's mother. Then the prick died from the wounds Quick inflicted to stop him from beating his mom. Now he was a fugitive from Shifter Law, even after the truth came out. That was the reason Maze usually drove the boat to the mainland, when the trip needed to be made. He didn't have a price on his head like Quick did. And from what he last heard, that amount was incredibly steep. Around two million dollars. No wonder everyone was after the shifter. A tickle to the back of his neck brought him from his thoughts. He turned to see the sedan that had pulled in behind the cab, still sitting in the distance. He couldn't remember if anyone had gotten out of the car. He turned back. Not his concern what other crazies did. When they walked into the restaurant, familiar faces greeted them. Adriana's attorneys were seated at a table. Ah, Mr. Turner, Miss Hinkle, one of the stately gentlemen said, standing to shake hands, how are you this lovely evening? The man gestured to the others at the table. You remember Ann Withers, Tom Whitmore, and of course, I'm Gerald Wizen. Feeling out of place, May smiled and slightly bowed his head toward each with a good to see you comment. Mr. Wizen continued. I wish to pass along our deepest sympathies of Mrs. Devereaux's passing. We loved her more than a client. She was family to us. Thank you, May said. Please let us know if you need anything, the woman sitting at the table added. We're here to help. Again, May said thank you. Sarah's voice pulled him away from the group. May's darlin, got your gumbo ready to go. His questioning eyes met the cafe's owners. How did she know he was coming in to order? She slipped a round container into a plastic bag and winked at him. When he took the bag she whispered, no worries sugar. I got you covered. He snatched the bag off the counter and smiled. There was no way he was going to piss off a witch, especially one as strong as Sarah. If she saw future events, no telling what she could do to someone who crossed her. Mays grabbed Angelina's hand and hurried toward the door. Need to get back to the island. Great seeing you all again. He looked at Sarah. And thanks. You're a goddess. She laughed. Don't forget that. S. Maze tripped out the door with Angelina in tow. After a minute, Angelina shivered as they walked. That was some kind of weird, huh? Maze snorted. You have no idea. What I've heard about that group is off the charts. Don't mess with witches. Ever. Yeah, she said, but how did they know my name? I've never met them before. Like I said, be glad those witches and wizards are on our side. They needed to hurry to the boat and get going. They had plenty of time to get to the island, but lunchtime was coming, and he had to walk Angelina to her family's home before heading back to the office. The bag in his hand began to seep heat where the container sat. He untied the top and stuck his nose inside. With a deep breath, he sucked in a whole lot of goodness. Which or not, the woman could cook. At the boat, he helped the woman with him in and followed her to the back. She sat, and the first breeze that hit him doused him in her perfume scent. He put his nose back into the bag. Much better. Maybe he could hold it there until they were going, and the wind changed direction. Chapter 3 Rissa Rissa remained calm as footsteps clomped toward the back where she hid under the seat cushion. She had her gun, so she wasn't really afraid of anything. She just didn't want to blow the cover she'd spent time building around the casino. Not that it was really a cover, either. Her plan, approved by the chief, was to frequent the casino as a regular person playing slots or whatever happened to draw her attention. She'd only been in a couple times, but felt certain the security cameras at the casino had her walking around and playing. The type of people she worried were involved with Kiva's disappearance were able to sniff out a cop a mile away. She had no idea how they managed it. It was as if their senses could smell the difference between regular folks and law enforcement. 
God, she hoped it wasn't that easy. Thinking of smells, a flowery scent tickled her nose, perfume. Then a delicious smell of gumbo wafted in. Just another trait she had that kids made fun of. God, she hated growing up. In her high school years, she'd learned how to hide her sharp perceptions and keep her mouth shut about things she shouldn't have been able to see or smell or hear. Voices drifted into her hiding place. She easily heard the conversation even over the engine noise, coming directly behind her. Angelina asked the guy about the new owner. Must be speaking of the owner of the place they were headed to. Were they headed to one of Lupin's secret hangouts? The damn casino owner was so rich, he could afford to buy an entire island. If what he earned was legit, she'd be fine with it, but all the rumors, suspicions and previous investigations had to have some basis. The boat slowed, and the engine quieted a bit. Rissa heard Angelina ask, does the portal still work like before? Adriana's death hasn't changed it. Death? Who was Adriana? Was she murdered? Why was the boat gearing down? They hadn't been on the water long enough to get anywhere. And portal? On the water? How many questions could one statement create? It did change somehow, the man said. But Quick was able to get through to pick up the new owner. She was able to reinstate the passage, but not everything is back to normal yet. Like what? Angelina asked. She almost sounded worried. There's nothing for you to worry about. I promise. We've got everything under control. You just enjoy yourself while you're here. Now get ready to go through. Go through what, she wondered. Suddenly, her stomach cramped. It would have doubled her over had she been standing. Biting her lips, she was able to keep any sound from escaping. Her head felt dizzy and her fingers and toes tingled. What was happening? Her body felt light, defying gravity. She put a hand out to make sure she wasn't floating away. In her next breath, she felt normal. Rissa took a deep lungful of air and held it, before letting it trickle out quietly. The boat picked up speed and the engines kicked in. Not long after, the boat slowed again, but this time there was activity on deck. She heard others not far away. They must have arrived. The engines shut off, startling Rissa with a sudden calmness, after feeling like riding in the cargo compartment of a jumbo jet. After a minute of no voices or activity, Rissa lifted the cushion she hid under and peeked out. They were docked at a small pier along a beautiful stretch of land. The sun sparkled on the water like a million diamonds shining. Rissa caught the tail end of Angelina at the end of the dock. She and the guy were following a path that lead into the woods. She pushed the lid up and climbed out, her body not happy with the movements after lying in the cramped space. She saw no signs of the others she heard when they docked. It was as if everyone disappeared. Her rubber-soled shoes let her move quickly as well as in stealth along the wood planks. At the end of the pier, she leaned against the pole and scoped the area. Still no one around. She took off down the path that lead into the trees. In the near distance, she heard Angelina laugh. Rissa was in pursuit. She wondered what kind of evidence lay hidden, and if this was Lupin's hideaway. Then a thought hit her. Could Kiva be at this house? Tied and gagged, praying for help. A shiver went down her back. She had that distinct feeling she got when close to trouble. She had no explanation for this trait. Her grandma told her it was deep intuition. Ever since she was a kid, she had the uncanny knack to know when danger was close. It had served her well growing up and in her law enforcement career. She never second-guessed the gift. Her fingers unsnapped the holster under her jacket while she edged closer to a thick tree. Angelina's voice no longer reached her ears. In fact, nothing made noise. Not even those chirpy bugs normally found in forested areas. Her senses sent adrenaline racing through her system. She plucked the gun from her shoulder holder. Whatever was coming had better be ready. She was first in her marksman class during training. Moving slowly, she stepped away from the trunk in the direction she'd come. Perhaps it was time to find the street and call Uber. A twig snapped. 
She swung her gun around, body following. In her peripheral vision, she saw a large gray animal spring from the brush. Before she could react, the beast slammed her to the ground. Hot breath warmed her face. In self-preservation, Rissa threw her arm in front of her. Sharp teeth dug in, sending a scream from her. The gun was long gone, so she fisted her hand and smashed the animal in the eye. The wolf yelped and backed off. Rissa scrambled onto her hands and knees, searching for her weapon while retreating. Unfortunately, the animal had different ideas for her. Rissa noticed the wolf lean back, preparing to lunge toward her. She tried to stand but her feet tangled in overgrown brush. The wolf leapt, wide open jaw aimed for her face. Falling, Rissa threw her arms up hoping she would die quickly. Her only regret was not saving Kiva from whatever happened to her. Her arm already bled freely. Blood dripped from her fingers. As she crashed onto her back, her head bounced off the ground and she waited for the razor teeth to sink in again. From the darkness, a huge black wolf, a different one, darted at her. Oh God, she thought. She couldn't fight one creature, much less two. And they were so large. Instead of attacking her, the animal smashed into the gray wolf, effectively saving her for the moment. The couple rolled, then separated. The gray backed away, teeth bared, deep growl vibrating its chest. Rissa heard pops and what sounded like material tearing. The black wolf stepped beside a tangle of brush that blocked her sight of it. Next thing she knew, the animal stood on two feet and was no longer a wolf but a man. A completely naked man at that. Angelina, he growled, enough. She's unarmed now. The gray wolf padded away into the night. W what just happened? Where did the wolf go, and how did the other one know what the man said? She looked between the man and the retreating creature. He stared down at her. Don't move. She nodded but kept her eyes roving, looking for her weapon. This was unreal. Of course it was unreal. What the hell was she thinking? The man must have followed her and scared the black one off, then the other one. She owed him her life. Her world now back in a logical realm, Rissa sat up a bit more. The man bent over and picked up clothes that lay in a heap on the ground. The shirt looked familiar. Like the one worn by the guy who drove the boat and walking with Angelina up ahead. He slipped pants on, then a shirt and shoes. The closer he came, the more familiar he looked. Good God. It was the man who drove the boat. And that made sense. He was walking in front of her and had come back. She felt so stupid for thinking he was the wolf. He didn't look so happy though. Why are you on my property? His property, she thought. Not Lupin's. Now she felt really stupid. I'm sorry. I'm here on police business. She started to reach into her pocket for her badge, then noted her blood-covered forearm. Oh shit. The man picked up something on the ground, then came toward her. You need medical attention. Damn, she sneered, you're a real Sherlock. He stopped and stared at her. Yeah, she needed to learn to control her tongue. Sorry, she said again. He grunted, then grabbed her under the arm and yanked her up. Hey asshole. She jerked her arm out of his hold. I'll have you arrested for assault of a police officer. I'll have you arrested for trespassing with no warrant. Well shit. He had her there. Her reason for intrusion would never be approved. Not to mention he was right. She didn't have a warrant. She kept her mouth shut. Now if you're through, the man said, I'll take you to the clinic to get you cleaned up. Her brows raised. Through. If I'm through. She poked him in the chest. Damn it. She couldn't think of anything to say that would put him in his place. Fine. I'm through. With a grunt he turned and walked away. He didn't say a word. Was she supposed to go with him? Her arm was starting to throb now that the adrenaline had drained. She lost sight of the man among the trees. Wonderful. Chapter 4 Maze Hey. Wait, the mouthy female called from behind him. Maze had no desire to wait for her. If she wanted medical attention, then she should keep up. 
The sun was high, but the forest was dark. That's why he planned the ambush with Angelina. Whoever this woman was, he smelled her the minute he stepped onto the boat on the city docks. He could have confronted her there on the dock. But he didn't have enough control of the situation on the mainland. The island was a different story. That was his domain. He'd get his answers there. The plan was working well. Angelina and he shifted as soon as they were out of sight and stalked the woman through the trees. He was intrigued how brave she was, not afraid of the dark, eerie woods, the basis for so many horror stories and movies. There was something else about her. Something he could only sense, nothing concrete. Something inside. Then she pulled out a weapon. One that shifters had a difficult time defending from. A bullet to much of the body wouldn't cause death, but it would hurt like hell for a while. So shifters usually sprang into action when a gun was presented, which was what Angelina did. If Mays hadn't intervened, he believed Angelina would have killed the woman who was trespassing. They had every right to protect themselves. But that little something about her kept him from letting her die. Look mister, she said, I'm sorry for mouthing off. I was just in a fight for my life against a wild animal. Her residual scent of fear floated on the light breeze. He stopped and looked back at her. Wild animal? Then he realized he'd shifted in front of the woman. Well, he knew he shifted, but the ramifications didn't dawn on him until now. Humans couldn't know shifters exist. He'd have to kill her. She suddenly stopped, eyes wide and fixed on him. That was intriguing. She became frightened the same time he thought about killing her. Was she a witch of some kind? Able to read minds? Or an empath that could feel emotions? Was that what he was sensing in her blood, which was running freely from her arm? Shit. He sighed and softened a bit. He wanted to talk to Quick before doing anything drastic. I saved your life. You're welcome. Now can we go to the clinic before you bleed to death? Quick would love to deal with that too this morning. His boss, Chief of Security Quick Alvarez, had his hands full dealing with the island's new owner, Vivian Devereaux. She smiled at him. Yes, please. She clutched her arm against her chest, smearing the red stain, making her look like she walked off the set of Horror Flick. He led her through the island compound toward the med center. Others stared as they passed. He heard a squeal behind him, cut off abruptly. He looked over his shoulder to see her staring at a wolf, her hand over her mouth. He's fine, they said. Tom won't hurt you. She gave him a look, but then followed him. Reaching a white, one-story structure, Mays pulled his keys from his pocket and opened the door. He flipped a switch and proceeded into the clinic's treatment area. He held open a door, motioned her to enter in front of him. Have a seat on the exam table, he said. At the cabinet along the wall, he washed his hands and slid on clear gloves. Let's see how bad it is. She held her arm out to him. The sleeve was tattered and ripped. Blood had dried and crusted, making her sleeve stiff and stick to her skin. He pulled scissors from a drawer and cut the sleeve to her elbow, then pulled away the material. She sucked in a sharp breath but didn't move. To his surprise, the bleeding had stopped. He turned the arm over. Gouges where the wolf's teeth sank in were evident, but closed over with a thin layer of skin. If what he suspected was true, then they had a problem on their hands. He looked into her eyes. Her brows crinkled. What? Why are you looking at me like that? Mays turned to the cabinet and pulled out items he'd need to clean her up. Pouring peroxide on a mesh pad, he asked, You ever going to tell me why you're here? She remained silent for a beat while he wiped the pad along her arm. Like I said, I'm on police business. Yeah, I got that, he said. How about shedding light on why you followed one of our people to the marina, stowed away on the boat, then snuck onto the island? She was speechless. He could only imagine what was going through her head. He laughed at her deer-in-the-headlights look. Then her eyes narrowed. Why didn't you call me out at the harbor, she asked. He shrugged. Guess I wanted to see what you were up to. Wait, she said. He wadded the blood-stained pad in his hand and pulled another. You said island. 
There are no islands like this, this close to the city. May scowled but kept quiet. He didn't want her finding out more than she already had. Not going to answer, are you? she asked. He picked up a roll of gauze and ripped a piece from the bundle, pointedly looking at her without responding. She squirmed under his scrutiny. He smelled her nervousness. Can I ask you a question? He sighed. Ask? Why were you naked in the forest? You spoke to the gray wolf and called her Angelina. The other was Tom. Do you really name animals after people? Whoa there. Mays lightly laughed. You said a question. Not a hundred. I feel like I'm losing my mind from what I saw. Mays froze. What do you think you saw? She shook her head. Nothing. It was dark, and I must have hit my head on the ground. The light playing tricks on my mind, that kind of thing. He knew what she saw, but if she didn't want to accept it, he wasn't going to make her. She looked at him. Are you going to answer my question? She asked. He smiled. Which one? She huffed. I want to know why you were naked. Yeah, a voice at the door said, why were you naked? Quick his boss smirked at him. Chapter 5 Rissa Rissa sat on the shaded back porch of the island's owner, a woman named Vivian Devereaux. Mays and his boss carried out trays of food and set them on the table. You have an amazing place, Miss Devereaux, Rissa said. Please, she replied, call me Vivian. No need for such formalities. Mays placed a toasted BLT in front of her. Fresh fruit piled to the side. Thank you. He gave her a genuine smile. He was really cute when he tried. No way she was telling him that though. Rissa, Vivian started, quick tells me you're here on police business. What kind exactly? Well damn it all to hell. The woman would ask a question right off the bat, one that she didn't want to answer. Now she had to decide if she should tell them the truth of the matter, or keep it all quiet. Could she trust these people to stay close-mouthed? The two men were security for the property, so she figured they could keep their mouths shut. But what about the Vivian? And Rissa, Vivian added, whatever you share with us will remain at this table. A calmness spread through her. She liked these people, even Mays, who was a pain in the ass earlier. Her senses only picked up goodness from them. All right, Rissa said, I'll share with you what I can. I'm investigating the disappearance of Kiva Werner, a friend of mine. Close friend. The last place she was seen was one of the casinos. The casino that Angelina Hinkle's boyfriend co-owns. Mays frowned. Is that why you were on the boat, he asked. Yes and no, Rissa replied. I searched the boat to find out who owned it but I hid because I didn't want to give my cover away. And to follow Angelina. Vivian set down her drink. What do you think Angelina can tell you? Rissa shrugged. I don't know, but I was hoping for some clue or hint. The trail to my friend is quickly growing cold. A rush of despair and anguish filled her. She hadn't expected that emotional reaction. This was the first time out loud, that she admitted she may never see Kiva again. Rissa had a rough childhood, and Kiva was the only person who stood beside her through all the teasing and taunting. Kiva even punched a boy in the nose for being mean to her. She owed so much to Kiva. She was more like a sister. The only family Rissa had alive. Rissa blinked back tears. Was she getting soft or what? Geesh. Maze put a hand over hers. Her eyes met his and she saw sympathy, herring. She pulled her hand back and cleared her throat. Anyway, I'm following every clue I can find, and this woman happens to be involved with the main suspect. Suspect, a slightly high-pitched voice came from several yards behind her. She turned to see Angelina walking across the grass toward them. How did the girl hear her from across the lawn? Rissa hid her face. Her cover was blown. Angelina would see her face in moments. I hope you don't mind, Vivian said. I invited her to join us for a few minutes. Rissa groaned, but she did want to interview the woman, so here was her chance. 
just a bit earlier than she had planned. Angelina, Vivian said, it's nice to meet you. The two shook hands. Did they not know each other? Vivian turned to Rissa. I recently arrived here and haven't had the chance to meet everyone yet. What the hell? Rissa thought. Was the woman a mind reader? How creepy she knew what Rissa was thinking. Then again, her questions were rather predictable to the events. Angelina, Vivian continued, this is Officer Rissa Belgrande with the New Orleans Police Department. She shook Angelina's hand. They exchanged greetings and a chair was pulled up beside Rissa. Miss Belgrande, Angelina said, what is this about Jeff being a suspect? What has he done? Rissa wiped a hand down her face. This was not the way she wanted this to start. She needed to take control of the situation. Miss Werner, she started, your boyfriend has not been charged with any crime. He is simply a person of interest right now. Obviously interesting enough to follow me and pull a gun on us, Angelina huffed. Shit, her gun. She dropped it in the forest when the wolf attacked. She stood to go in search of it. Where was her mind? Wait, May said. He placed her weapon on the table. I picked it up on the way to the med center. She didn't remember him doing that. But she was delirious at the time. Seeing wolves change into people, wild animals obeying humans and a wolf named Angelina. Quite coincidental. She glanced at the woman again and slowly sat. She holstered her gun. One thing struck her though. Angelina the human was nowhere in sight when Rissa had her gun out. Only Angelina the wolf was there. So how did Angelina know she'd pulled a gun on the wolf? Rissa's head felt like it was spinning. Damn, she needed to get the hell away from this place. Fast. Ah, thank you, Maze. He nodded, frowned, then rose to his feet. He nodded for Quick to follow him. What were they discussing that she couldn't know about? Angelina, Rissa started again, I mean no ill will toward your boyfriend. My friend has gone missing. Tears stung again, damn it. The last place she was seen was his establishment. I'm just trying to find out what happened to her. Oh, the girl said. I'm sure he had nothing to do with it, but I'll help any way I can. I very much appreciate it. What do you want to know? Angelina asked. Now that her opportunity was at hand, she didn't know exactly how to word what she needed to know. She operated so much by her intuition that when it came to hard facts, sometimes they lacked. She did have a general question though. Why are you here? Rissa asked. Angelina looked at Vivian then Rissa. My family lives here. I'm visiting them. Do you get to see them a lot? Not as much anymore. Jeff only sends me home when he knows he's working late. And tonight Jeff is working late? Rissa asked. Angelina nodded. I guess. Any idea what he's doing? No. Something with his investors and bankers. That's all I heard. Rissa noted Mays and his boss were finished speaking and coming back to the table. To her surprise, Quick stopped beside her, lowered his head to her shoulder and sniffed a deep breath. Alarmed, Rissa scooted her chair so hard to the side she almost knocked Vivian from hers. Quick straightened. You're right, Mays. Gonna have to kill her. Chapter 6 Maze Maze laughed at Rissa's reaction to Quick's words. She pointed her gun at his boss as she fell from her chair to the porch's wooden slat floor. Damn that was funny. Quick what the hell is wrong with you? Vivian said. She flashed Maze the stink eye and he instantly stopped laughing. You scared our guest. Vivian leaned over to help Rissa up, but Rissa ignored the offered hand. She climbed to her feet, gun still aimed. Quick stepped back, his hands out. I apologize, Quick said, I didn't mean to frighten you. I like to joke and forgot, even though you are one of us, you're not, really. Vivian snapped her head around. She's a shifter, she asked. Her eyes turned to the woman who had stowed away on the boat a few hours ago. His boss had confirmed what May suspected. 
Rissa Belgrande had a shifter in her family tree, probably several generations back. And she carried the DNA in traits to prove it. Vivian chewed on her bottom lip. Well, this is awkward. She put her napkin on the glass top table. Angelina, if you would excuse us. Thank you for coming over on such short notice. The wolf shifter slowly stood and backed away from Rissa toward the backyard. Anything for you, Miss Devereaux. Call if you need me again. Angelina stepped into the grass and was gone in a flash. Rissa's jaw dropped. W, where did she go? She was there one second and gone the next. Vivian sighed. Miss Belgrande, please have a seat. We have something quite serious to discuss. No shit, Rissa said, like how I'm leaving this little get together of yours right now. May stepped toward her. Her gun pinned him in place. It was a joke. Just a joke. Okay. Sorry. He could tell he wasn't getting through to her. He needed to take another approach. Do you know why you can do things others can't, like smell things others don't, see farther, or hear things you shouldn't be able to hear? Her eyes grew large. Maze continued, can you sense things, like when danger is close or someone is sneaking up on you? He paused. Oh wait, you don't have that, or you would have heard us in the woods. But you get what I mean. The surprise on her face told him he was right. He headed back to his chair as casual as he could, with a gun pointed at him. Sit down and we'll tell you why you can to all that stuff. Quick took a seat next to him. Both men looked to Vivian for help. Good God, her eyes rolled, sometimes men are useless. She snapped her fingers softly, barely making a sound, and the gun's safety clicked into place making the weapon inoperable. Rissa drew her brows in and flipped the safety back to off. Vivian snapped her fingers again and this time used magic to bring the gun to the table. Rissa rose to a stand wide-eyed staring at her piece. Fear rolled off her in waves but her expression was schooled to appear strong. She was cool-headed, he'd give her that. Now Rissa please sit. Your meal is getting cold. She didn't move. Rissa, don't make me use magic to put you in a seat. That got Rissa moving. She scooted her chair away from Vivian, then realized how close she was to Quick, and scooted back over, then glanced back at Vivian and stepped back again. Quick reached out and shoved the chair onto the ground. Sit. She finally complied. Mays worried that she hadn't said a word. He felt her too strong to be terrorized by this. Okay, Vivian said, I'm just going to spit it out. Rissa, you have shifter blood flowing through you. That's why you can do all the things Maze listed. You probably have more abilities than he mentioned. You can explore those whenever you want. Rissa's eyes narrowed. What's a shifter? Oh right, Vivian replied. Quick if you would be so kind, just a partial. No stripping right now. Maze watched her carefully as his boss morphed partially into his wolf. To her credit, she didn't jump away. She didn't even blink. Oh shit, was she even breathing? Mays leaned across the table. A smile spread on her face. Mays stopped and slowly sat back. Watching her. Why was she smiling? I got it, she said. Her body was relaxed and her scent was normal, giving off no fear. Thank you for lunch, Vivian. But I need to get back to the office before the chief reports me missing. With a pasted on smile, she snagged her gun and tucked it away. Vivian set her fork down and stood with the rest of them. Mays will take you back to the mainland. No, Rissa started. Vivian raised a hand. It's the only way off the island. Please. Vivian gave her a pleading look. Oh right. This is an island that isn't on any map I've seen, Rissa responded. She turned to Mays. Let's go. Chapter 7 Rissa Rissa sat on the boat's back bench and watched the waves spread behind them. She was processing what she was just told, trying to rationalize it. Trying to put some kind of logic to it. Wasn't working. No matter how she looked at it, humans didn't, couldn't, shouldn't turn into wolves. And them telling her she could. Whatever. But that did explain 
a lot of the oddities she experienced growing up. Her ability to run freakishly fast. Why cats always hissed at her when she walked by. And of course, her senses. Oh God. Was it really true? She lifted her hand and pictured it as a furry paw. Her focus zeroed in on her skin. Nothing happened. I doubt you'll be able to shift, May said. Only extremely strong shifters can do a partial like Quick did. Can you? she asked. He stuck his arm out and fur came through the pores. She gasped and tentatively raised her hand toward him. You can touch it. It's just regular fur, Mays told her. She brushed her fingers over the hair and smiled. It's really soft. She dug deeper, getting down to his skin. Cool. This really is real, isn't it? He pulled away and shifted back. It is. If you want, I or Quick can train you to use your gifts better. She looked up at him. Will it help me find my friend sooner? He held her gaze dead on. Yes. Rissa sat on the back cushions. Hope coursed through her heart. No matter where Kiva was, she would find her. You know, May said, dragging the toe of his boot on the decking, I could, uh, maybe if you want, um, you know, help you find your friend. He added quickly. And we could train at the same time. Maybe if you want, you know. Mays, she replied, I would love to have your help on this case. His eyes lit up. Really? Yes, really. She put on a serious face. But if I tell you to get low or stay in the car, I mean it. Got it. He snapped to attention and saluted. Yes, ma'am. Got it. He relaxed. What's the plan? That was a good question. What was a plan? What had she learned from Angelina? According to Angelina, Jeffers Lupin sends her home when he's working late. You think some kind of deal is going down tonight? Mays asked. I have a strong hunch there is, she said. How do we find out for sure? Mays asked. She thought about that for a minute. In her years on the force, she'd done more than her fair share of stakeouts. This was looking like another one. We sit back, watch and listen, she responded. But we need to find Lupin first. Let's hope he's at the casino. Where else could he be? Mays wondered. He has several places he frequents. One is a strip bar. I'm sure his girlfriend would disapprove. A growl came and went from Mays. She turned to him. Do that again. He sputtered with surprise and leaned away, his cheeks turning red. I can't growl on command. He stepped toward to the captain's chair. Maybe later. This is your idea of a stakeout. May said as Rissa dropped nickels into a slot machine. It is if we're casing a casino, she replied. Several rose up, a light twirled above a slot and an alarm beeped. They saw the person playing the machine jump up and down, arms waving in the air. Must have won big, Rissa said. Lucky jerk. She dropped in another nickel and pushed the max button. For the millionth time, no payout. Come on. Let's walk around. Mays gladly followed. What are we looking for anyway? It looks like a normal casino to me. She looked at him. How many times have you been in a casino? She asked. He shrugged. I don't know. Five or six times, he said. Which ones? Here in New Orleans or elsewhere? Just here, Mays replied. Then you probably don't understand the difference between the older Mays style floor layout and the modern playground layout, she quipped. Ah, Mays looked around the room, no. Earlier floor designs were to suck players in and make it hard to leave. There were no windows, no clocks to keep players oblivious of time. The exit signs were small and the spaces were set up so that a player had to walk through a maze of tables and machines before being able to get out of a room. Also, slots were set up in long rows side by side where one person sat and played. Others with that person stood around. Mays saw a lot of those elements as they walked. So what do the newer places look like, he asked. Rissa responded, it's all based on psychological needs. The low ceiling became skylights, smaller groups of machines with more open spaces were put in. 
The place was airy and open. People saw sculptures and sunlight and wide walkways leading to tables. The casino transformed into an inviting spa experience. Spa experience? Mays repeated. Yeah, slots have become the money-making machine for casinos. And who plays slots more? Rissa asked. Mays glanced back from where they came. Looks like females in their mid-fifties. You are correct, Rissa said. Females 55 to 60 with a college education and household income over $55,000. Rissa suddenly stopped and turned toward him. Mays had to use his shifter agility to keep from plowing over her. Born me next time woman, he growled. I just about made you a splotch on the carpet. Yeah, whatever. She hooked a thumb over her shoulder. Don't look now, but you see those two guys in the black suits. Mays leaned sideways to look around her. She grabbed his arm and yanked him back. I said don't look now. How do you want me to see them then, he growled. Damn if this woman wouldn't be the end of him. Don't be obvious. Only move your eyes, not your whole body. Mays did as she said. Standing beside a door that read employees only, two men dressed in expensive suites looked over the crowd, talking quietly to one another. One of them looked familiar. Yeah, what about them? Mays asked. They're the casino's co-owners, Jeffers Lupin and Frank Bonaparte. Jeffers Lupin? Mays breathed. The same Jeff Lupin who used to be a prosecutor. I believe that's what I read on him. He came into a lot of money a while ago and bought the casino from the owner. Do you know him? Rissa asked. Hell yeah, Mays knew who the asshole was. The same prick who prosecuted Quick for murdering his father. The bastard withheld evidence and bribed the judge to get Quick convicted. But he wasn't sharing that info yet. I've heard of him. She narrowed her eyes at him. He forgot she was part shifter. She probably smelled his lie. She'd get over it. Rissa turned sideways and turned her head slightly to get a visual on them again. What are they doing? Mays asked. Good question, she said. You stay here, and I'll follow to see if I can hear part of their conversation. He grabbed her arm. I'm not letting you go alone, Mays grumbled. Well, she replied, jerking out of his hold. I'm not letting you come along, so get over it. She got in his face. Stay put. Damn, she was so cute when pissed off. He shook his head clear of all those feelings. Now was not the time to think about getting involved. His eyes followed her progress. He glanced where the men were standing and noted they weren't there anymore. A bit frantic, he scoped the area for them. He couldn't find them in the crowd. Worse yet, he lost track of Rissa too. Staying put was for the birds. He set off in the direction Rissa had did a minute ago. Shit. Where did she go? He casually cruised the main aisle, eyes darting to see everything at once. He turned to see Lupin with his hand on Rissa. Chapter 8 Rissa Rissa had forgotten what it was like to work with a partner. A male one at that. Besides a general pain in the ass, she'd say they were overprotective and overbearing. What was she thinking when she said yes to his helping? She shook her head to clear her thoughts. When hunting the man she was after, not being prepared could be deadly. What surprised her was Mays knew the man during his prosecutor years. She'd spent a lot of time going through Lupin's past. She found it very interesting that he won all his high-profile cases, even when evidence was overwhelmingly for the other side. And how does a prosecutor come into enough money to buy a casino? Where'd the money come from? She hadn't seen an immediate trail. Something was wrong there. Her senses snapped her out of her thoughts. A hand grabbed her elbow and an arm wrapped around her waist, pulling her back against a rock-hard body. An expensive cologne reached her nose while a hot breath warmed the side of her neck. Her captor breathed in deeply like Quick did this morning when sitting at the table for breakfast. What the hell? Officer Belgrande, the man said with a snotty lilt to his voice, good to see you again. Damn it. How did the man know who she was? 
she was sure her cover as a normal slot player had been solid. How had he singled her out? She wiggled to get free, but he wasn't loosening his hold. Not wanting to make a scene, she settled there. No one gave them a second glance, as they looked like any other couple in the room. Lupin, let me go before I have you arrested for assault of a police officer, she grinded out. He leaned his head to her ear. How can something so enjoyable be a crime? She could hear the smile in his voice. Yes, the man enjoyed having physical control over others. I'm not finding being so close to you enjoyable. In fact, I could throw up any time. The arm on her waist slid up around her ribcage and tightened, constricting her breathing. Her body cringed, but his hold on her kept her pinned to him. As her breath left her, his squeeze rivaled a python slowly killing its prey. Lupin, Rissa hissed, don't make me hurt you. He laughed quietly and lessened his embrace. We wouldn't want that, now would we? He sucked in another breath. What the hell is wrong you, Lupin? Having sinus problems, she goaded. Was there a connection between Lupin and shifters? Holy shit. Was he a shifter, too? Hardly, officer, he said. Where have you been recently? You have a familiar smell on you. Long ago type of familiar. Rissa took advantage of his inattention and yanked out of his grip. She needed to remain calm. Not play into his hands. Police work, Lupin. Where I go is none of your business. His brow rose. Are you on the job now? In my casino. Shit. What was the best answer? She didn't want him to know she was investigating Kiva's disappearance, but if she lied, he could easily call the precinct and find out. He had cops in his pockets, of that she was sure. I'm looking for someone who's here. She glanced around for Maze. He would be her way out. She saw him dart behind a machine. Guess he didn't want Lupin seeing him. Well, Lupin said, I'd like to help but I'm on my way out. Short day, she scoffed. It's just afternoon. You a banker now? Although I'd love to stay and banter with you, Officer Belgrande, I do have a meeting to attend. Perhaps we could have dinner and continue our discussion. His eyes made their way over her body. Now she did want to puke. She snorted. A snowball's chance in hell I'll ever go out with you. Don't you have a girlfriend, anyway? A creepy smile spread on his face. Good day, officer. He walked away. She waited until he was at a distance and headed for Maze. She had to ask him if Lupin was a shifter too. My God. How many shifters were there? Could she beat him if he were? She passed a row of slots and a hand snagged her arm and jerked her to the side. If it was Lupin again, she was ready to show him her uppercut. But it wasn't. Maze damn it, she whispered. You scared the shit out of me. Sorry, I was on my way to help you, but I couldn't let him know I'm here. It wouldn't be good if he knew. She took his arm and pulled him with her. He might know already. Come on. We're leaving. Where are we going, he asked. What do you mean he might know? Did you tell him something? No. He smelled me. Well shit. Yes he would smell me on you damn it, May said as he followed. We should have thought of that beforehand. Yeah well, I'm just starting to get used to this shifter stuff, she said. We're following Lupin. He nodded. Stepping outside, Rissa had to shade her eyes for a second. She pulled sunglasses from her pocket. Maze, she said, I need you to tell me everything shifters can do. And your weaknesses. I have to find a way to kill you. Chapter 9 Maze Maze frowned. What the hell? Rissa laughed. Payback's a bitch. Quick was the one who said that to you, not me, he responded. But he had to admit that it was pretty good. Rissa held her key fob up and the doors to her car unlocked. Now talk, she said to him. He racked his brain listing everything he could think of that related to shifter abilities. Which was actually a lot when it came down to it. 
After several turns and lights, they parked along the street with industrial buildings. They watched as Lupin left his car, carrying a briefcase, and walked into a building. Mays looked for a business sign that would tell them the building's name. Not only was there no sign, but there were no other company signs in the surrounding places. The area looked deserted. Where are we? he asked. Rissa had her phone up, thumb typing. Internet says this is a laboratory that processes DNA samples and carry out requested research, she responded. We going in? he asked. When Lupin comes out, we will. Awesome. There he is. Rissa's head snapped up. Already. He doesn't have the briefcase he walked in with. He doesn't, Mays confirmed. They watched him pull out of the lot and disappear around the corner. Internet say anything else about this place? Not really, she said, just phone number. She looked at him. Ready? Mays followed Rissa across the parking lot to the door Lupin entered and left from. She reached inside her jacket and pulled out her badge. Officers Belgrande and Mays. We're here on complaints of late night disturbances of peace. Can we speak to someone in charge? Yes, ma'am, I mean, officer. Her shaky hand pushed a button on the board in front of her. The director will be up shortly. Thank you, Rissa said, putting her badge away and stepping back from the desk. With a breath, Mays realized the woman behind the desk was a shifter. It didn't surprise him a lot. Shifters regularly worked on the mainland. What did make him wonder was why he'd never seen her before. He was sure he knew every shifter on the island. His security job required it, for the most part. So why hadn't he met her? He needed to check with Quick. Perhaps with Adriana's death, shifters were no longer checked out when they entered town. It was more likely the woman was new. A thought crossed his mind. He pulled out his phone and typed in a memo app. He handed his phone to Rissa. She read it then looked at him. Got it. A side door opened and a tall thin man stepped through. Mays took his phone back and erased the memo. Rissa confidently walked up to the man and shook his hand. No hesitation, no worries. I'm Joel Newsom, director here. Officers Belgrande and Mays. Thank you for seeing us, Mr. Newsom. Let's go to my office, the director said. He turned and headed down a hallway. Rissa looked over her shoulder at Mays and raised her brow. Mays wasn't sure what the look was for, but his guess would be she wanted to know if the director was a shifter or not. Mays gave a small shake of his head. The director was completely human. She nodded her acknowledgement. They came to large windows on both sides that overlooked labs. What do you do here, Mr. Newsom? Rissa asked. The director stopped and stared into one of the labs. We uh, process DNA samples and carry out requested research. He turned. My office is just this way. Mays wondered if Rissa caught it, but the director repeated the exact words the internet had for them. Surely the director of the company knew what they did, beyond online generalities. A man wearing a white doctor's coat came around the corner, opened a door, and entered a room. Rissa lunged forward and caught the door before it closed. Mays came up behind her and his eyes roamed the room. All looked fine as far as he knew about labs, which wasn't much. The director huffed at them. This way please. Another door down, the director stood, holding it open. They walked in and had a seat in front of the cheap desk. So, the director said, is there a problem? Rissa answered. Yes. Our office has received several complaints about noise and activity at night. The man's brows lowered. I don't understand. We aren't open at night. We close at five. Every night. Rissa drilled the question in a way that made the director nervous. Well, the man stuttered, we have a pickup or two. On occasion. What would this pickup consist of? She asked. May smelled the stench of fear. What was the man hiding? I'm not able to share that information with you, officer. She smiled. I understand. May I use the restroom? The director's eyes grew large. Rissa crossed her legs and bounced. I really would appreciate it. 
I had two glasses of tea at lunch. A uh, sure, he said. Down the side hall. Second door. Rissa was out of her chair and through the door in seconds. Thank you, director. Be right back. Mays realized what just happened. He now had to occupy this stranger's time while Rissa snuck around. He was so not good at this kind of thing. So, director, tell me about yourself. Chapter 10 Rissa Rissa loved this aspect of investigations, sneaking around, looking for clues. She'd always been good at it, and now she knew why. Her shifter senses had developed into instincts she depended on to keep her out of trouble. Most of the time, anyway. She still wanted to learn about shifting. And when she could actually do that herself. Passing the restrooms, she continued down the hall like she had a mission and was supposed to be there. That was the trick to getting in to just about anywhere. If you looked like you belonged, others generally didn't question you. And if you held an angry expression like you were about to choose someone a new asshole, nobody would get in your way. She opened doors as she made her way down the hall. One was another lab, where technicians were filling bags with a red fluid. She was pretty sure it was blood. Kind of like what a donor facility would do. The next door was an empty office, and the third door opened to a small area with file cabinets, a desk and a heavy-duty metal door. She pulled on the handle, but it was locked. So much for that. What would they be keeping behind such a door? Time was running out. She turned back to the hall door and it opened as she reached for it. In surprise she jumped back. Seeing a technician, she laughed. Oh my goodness, Rissa said, you scared me. She laughed again with a startled employee who was pushing a cart loaded with blood bags. The same type as she saw them filling moments ago. Here, Rissa jumped forward and grabbed the hallway door, let me hold this for you. Thank you, the woman said with a smile. She rolled the cart to the metal door and took a security card from her pocket and placed it over the scanner next to the door. After a beep, the door popped open. Rissa hurried to hold it as best she could for the woman to pull the cart into the new room. Except it wasn't a room as much as a refrigeration unit. The inside was all chrome with wire racks that served as shelves. And on these were hundreds of bags of blood. She'd never been to a blood bank before, but his had to rival one. Good grief. Need any help? Rissa asked. The woman shook her head. No, thanks for getting the door. You're welcome. Anytime. Rissa let the metal door close and stepped back into the hall. She decided to check a couple more doors before getting back to the director's office. When she glanced down the hall, she noted the last door was different and looked a bit beat up. She opened it to peek into a large warehouse-like space. Garage doors on the far end opened to loading docks for large trucks. Box supplies were stacked on more shelves, plus there were two forklifts parked along the wall. She heard a clang of metal hitting metal and looked around for the source. On the front of a large metal pod container, a narrow door slid open. Two huge men in scrubs stepped out, adjusting their clothing. One stuck his head back through the doorway. Thank you, ladies. The other guy slammed the container door closed and nestled a padlock to it. They headed her way, talking and laughing. What she just witnessed slammed into her. Women were locked in that container. She quietly closed the door and took off running down the hall. Having the men see her wouldn't be a good thing. Not at all. At the corner of the aisle leading to the director's office, she stopped, composed herself and hurried on. The director stood with Mays just outside the door. The director wore a scowl. Mays looked way out of his comfort zone. Poor guy. Sorry, director, she said. Not enough fiber this morning. The director's frown bloomed into a red face of embarrassment. Maze's eyes widened. She held back a laugh. Grabbing Maze's arm, she said, Thank you for your time, Director, but we need to get going. We'll get back with you if we receive further complaints. She dragged him down the hall without looking back. In the car, Rissa took a second to get her thoughts straight before telling Maze what she learned. Rissa, he said. Give me just a minute. 
Yeah, sure, he continued, but you didn't really, I mean it's okay, natural and all, and you don't have to tell me. Spit it out, she huffed. Did you really have to tell him you're constipated? His nose scrunched up making her laugh. Laugh hard. Enough to ease the horror she had been privy to. She could think clearer now. Thank you for the laugh, she said. Needed that. She started the car and drove away. Here's the situation, she started. In the warehouse at the back, there's a rectangular metal box holding women. I don't know how many, but more than one. What do you mean, holding women? Mays asked. Just that, she replied. I saw two men come out of it, hiking their pants up, she shuddered. Then padlocking the door. Get it? Locking the door on the outside. With a padlock. While those women were inside. She knew her voice was rising to a feverish pitch, but she couldn't control it. Her rage was getting the best of her. A loud pop and stretching sound whipped her head toward him. His arms were morphing. Maze? You can't shift in my car. Calm down. She couldn't have a damned wolf in her car. That wouldn't go over too well if anyone saw them. His jaw clenched. I can't calm down. Go back. Now. We can't leave those women locked up. No, we can't yet, she replied. Yes. Now. His face started to distort. Rissa slammed on the brakes. Listen to me. The men coming out of the container had to be shifters. They had to be. They reminded me of, she couldn't say their size and swagger reminded her of the shifters she was now aware of. That would include Mays and his boss Quick. They had to be shifters. And there are probably more where they came from. Meaning we can't take them all on our own. We need backup. He didn't seem to be calming any. Hey Mays, she poked him in the arm, probably dangerous, but what the hell, he wasn't listening, do you get what I'm saying? We will lose, and end up with the women in captivity. What good are we then? He took a deep breath. Yeah, I get you. But we need to rescue them now. Is there any place here in town where we can get help? She asked. More of your kind. Yeah, May said. Turn here. Rissa made a sharp turn and followed his directions. She hadn't told him the women were being moved tonight, but he seemed in such a hurry to get to the women, it didn't feel like an issue. Looks like she had to searching for Kiva for the time being. She sighed. Time felt like it was running out. Chapter 11 Maze Maze was nearly out of his skull with anger and worry. Women were being held against their will and physically abused. And he needed to do something about it. He couldn't sit back and do nothing while these women could be killed. The last time he faced this situation, he stood in his best friend's living room watching Quick's dad beat the shit out of Quick's mother, and Quick attacking his father to get him to leave his mother alone. That hadn't turned out well for anyone involved. It ended with two deaths, a murder conviction and accessory for Mays. The system had failed them, but with Lupin as the crooked prosecutor, what did they expect? This time, it would end differently. Rissa had asked for help. The only people he trusted on the mainland were a group of attorneys and a fabulous gumbo chef. He gave her directions to Wits and Wiz attorneys. When they parked across the street, Sarah from the next door cafe stood in the door waving them in. Hurry up, y'all. Gumbo's getting cold, Sarah shouted. Rissa looked at him and he shrugged. Sarah was known for her ability to foresee the future. She'd freaked him out before by having his order ready before he even walked into the cafe. They stepped onto the sidewalk outside the cafe. Good to see you again, Maze. Sarah said. The three walked inside the building. Sarah, the head attorney said, please take Mr. Turner into the room. I'll be there shortly. Absolutely, Mr. Wizen, Sarah replied. He and Rissa took seats in an adjoining meeting room. Mr. Wizen joined him and Rissa and the other two attorneys, already at the table. Mr. Turner, good to see you again. Miss Belgrande, nice to meet you. He held his hand out to her. I'm Gerald Wizen. 
He nodded to his compadres, Ann Withers and Tom Whitmore. Mace couldn't shake the feeling that he and Rissa were attending the lawyer's meeting, instead of him asking to meet with the attorneys for help. Witches and wizards, they creeped him out sometimes. Mr. Turner, Anne started, what do we owe this visit to? Mays tilted his head. So you know we're coming but you don't know why, he asked. We're not gods, Gerald said and smiled, but we're working on it. He winked. Got it, Mays said. Ah, we're wondering if you can give us some help. Have you noticed anything strange going on in the city? Gerald raised a brow. You do realize this is New Orleans, yes? Strange is normal here. Rissa laughed. You are correct, Mr. Wizen. How about anything unexpected? Ah, that we can help with, Tom the Quiet One said. There have been more vampire sightings than normal these past several days. And not just any vampires. No, Anne continued, but high-ranking elite from different covens. They hang out at Lupin's nightclub. Mays thought that was interesting since he didn't know vampires were allowed in the city at all. Rissa asked, I'm going to pretend vampires exist and ask the obvious here. Why is seeing more here unusual? Because of the witches, Gerald said. Mays jumped in to expedite the questioning. New Orleans is ruled by a powerful witch coven. Historically, witches, shifters, and vampires don't get along. Why not? Rissa asked. Gerald continued. Besides each wanting control and power over the others, Shifter blood is special for vampires. It gives the vampire an enormous boost in energy and power for a limited time. Shifters always have to watch their backs with vampires around. What about the witches? Maze asked. Anne said, witches just don't like anybody else. Nothing special otherwise. So how is Lupin still in business in a witch town? He's a shifter, Rissa said. Gerald cut in. Jeffers Lupin is co-owner of the casino. His partner is Frank Bonaparte. Mays dropped his spoon. He wasn't aware of that. He knew Frank was Vivian's uncle, who had taken over the coven after Vivian's parents' mysterious death. The uncle also wanted Vivian dead, why he wasn't sure. But Mays would bet it had to do with the island. Mays met eyes with Gerald. Isn't he the head of the witch coven? One in the same, Gerald said. Rissa frowned. Then a witch and a shifter are working together. How is that possible if they hate each other? Interesting, isn't it? The attorney said. Apparently, they have a business arrangement lucrative enough for them to work together. Mays nodded. That's interesting and all, but we're needing shifter power. I'm not concerned about vampires right now. What's the situation? Anne asked. Not sure we can help with a mass of shifters on short notice. You have more resources than we do, Mr. Turner. May sighed. I was afraid of that. He looked at Rissa. She gave him a nod. He continued. We're not positive, but we think we found a group of women being held against their will at a laboratory warehouse across town. We need help breaking them out. The attorneys looked at each other. We are unaware of this, Anne said. Is it a one-time thing, or does it look like a ring? Rissa said, I saw the women in a movable pod container. It didn't look very professional, or highly organized. My guess is this is relatively new. And it seems something is happening tonight. The women are being moved. May snapped his head around. You didn't mention that. Yeah, sorry, she said. His unease ratcheted up ten score. He could barely stay in his chair. Gerald stood. Looks like we've got some work to do. They all shook hands. I don't think we can do a lot. The coven won't care much since it's not their people. But we'll try. Thank you, Mr. Wizen. That's all we can ask, Rissa said. May snagged Rissa's arm and hurried toward the exit. Chapter 12 Rissa. Rissa could hardly contain Mays enough to get him back in her car after their meeting with the attorneys. He was desperate to get to the captured women, and she understood why. She wanted to get to them also. But procedures had to be followed. 
rules had to be obeyed. Otherwise, the law could only do so much. They had to do everything by the rules. Maze, look, Rissa said, let me talk with my boss and see what he can do. The law enforcement has to take the lead with this. The law is all we have. Yeah, I know, but he managed to say. Let's go to the precinct and see what the chief has to say, okay? She said. Yeah, fine. They sat quietly, lost in their own thoughts on the way to the station. Rissa tried to find a reason Jeffers Lupin would visit the lab. If she wasn't afraid the director would go to him, she would have asked why Lupin was there. The last thing she needed was for Lupin to be more suspicious of her than he already was. She held the front door to the precinct open for Maze. She wasn't entirely sure he would come inside. He gave off waves of anxious energy that even she could feel. At her desk, she dropped her purse into a bottom drawer and glanced at the line of emails in her inbox. They ran from the top of the message list to the bottom. Some were junk but many weren't. Mays leaned against her cubbyhole cube. What are all those pictures? he asked referring to rows of headshots lining the one wall. Those are missing people, she said without looking up. All of them, he questioned. She paused and looked at them. Really looked at the faces for the first time. They had all been yet another person gone, another person she had no to relation to. Each face was special to someone, loved by someone. Now her best friend belonged on that list. She would never look at the wall the same again. She watched as Mays went from photo to photo, getting up close and personal. When he turned, she noticed how upset he was. You okay? No, not really. He sat in a chair next to her cube. What's wrong? What could bother a tough guy like him so much, she wondered. He sighed. Many, too many of those pictures are of women shifters. Really? she asked. You can tell just by looking at them that they're shifters. Shifters usually have a thin gold ring around their irises. Characteristic of the animal inside, May said. He turned to her. She looked into his eyes. Why was it so easy to do that? Then she noticed the ring, so thin, just a hint of gold that lined his irises. I see it. He nodded. Now that her world had been open to the knowledge of shifters, she guessed things wouldn't be the same. I wouldn't have thought there were so many of you around, since we've never heard about you. That is what's bothering me. I don't get it, she said. What? Mays shifted in his chair. The island is a home to any shifter who wants or need a place to live. While Adriana ran the island, we knew of every shifter who came into town, and we were able to make contact and help them however we could. Or so I thought. But maybe not. Mays looked around as if seeking eavesdroppers. Seeing none, he continued. But now I don't know. All these shifters are missing, and I've never seen or heard about them. And the receptionist at the lab, I'd never met her either. There are so many people in this town coming and going. Maybe you just can't keep up with it all. They got here under the radar, Rissa suggested. Yeah, maybe, May said, but he didn't look relieved. On the other side of the room, a door to an office opened. Belgrande, the chief said, popping his head out. You want to talk to me? She stood, pulling on May's sleeve. Yeah, need your help. She led him into her boss's office. He was sitting behind his desk where she was used to seeing him. What you got? the chief asked. Rissa gave the rundown of what she came across at the lab. And you're sure women were in the container, even though you didn't actually look inside the box? the chief asked. Absolutely, certain. What else could it be? Rissa commented. Her boss sat back in his creaking desk chair. I don't know, Belgrande. Perhaps you're misreading what happened. No way, sir. I know what I saw, she said adamantly. I'll see what I can do, but it probably won't be until tomorrow to get a search warrant, he said. No, May said, we can't wait that long. We need to get them out now. The chief of police looked at him. And you are. Sorry, Rissa said. This is May's Turner. He was at the lab too. Her boss turned to him. 
You see this container of women, too? May scowled. No, but I believe what Re Officer Belgrande saw. I think we need to act now. Hold on there, cowboy, the chief chuckled. This isn't a posse town. We do things in proper order according to the law. And that takes time. To her relief, Mays remained quiet. With all respect, sir, she continued, we don't have until tomorrow. If I understood what they said. If you understood is the key phrase Belgrande, the chief went on, I'll send someone over to look at things. But sir, tonight, Rissa tried. Belgrande don't, her boss warned. She sighed and bit her lip to keep her harsh reply in check. Let me do some looking into this and see what we can do. Okay. I'll keep you updated. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. She stood and nodded to Mays to leave. Rissa walked past her desk and out the front doors. She was too wound up to sit. The sidewalk seemed a nice place to vent her pent-up anger. Stepping onto the concrete, she paced, hands and fists. Mays parked himself against the raised flower bed, arms crossed. What are we going to do? Get them out ourselves? No, we can't. There are more shifters there than just two. We're outnumbered. I'm not scared of the odds, May said. She couldn't believe he was playing the macho male bullshit. That's what got cops killed. Human bodies couldn't outdo bullets. Then it dawned on her, Mays didn't have a human body as such. What do standard rounds do to your bodies, she asked. At close range, May started, considerable damage could happen. But as I mentioned before, we heal faster than humans. It's hard to kill us. That was good to know, but didn't change anything right now. They would still be outdone by those at the lab. So we going, the shifter asked. No, we wouldn't do any good. We need a plan, she said. That's what I figured. Mays walked the other way. I'm out of here. What? Where are you going, Turner? She shouted at him. You're punking out? Seriously? He kept going, not even turning back to reply. I thought the odds didn't scare you. Mays didn't take the bait. Damn. She was on her own now. Chapter 13 Rissa Trying to lose the feeling of hopelessness at what felt like another setback, Rissa went back to casino. She didn't know what good it would do, but clues for Kiva's disappearance were few and far between. At a bar in the slot section, she ordered a water. She was still on duty, so getting sloshed wasn't in the cards at the moment. As she waited for her beverage, an alarm and twirling red light went off in a row of slots. Seemed another person had hit it big. A waitress nearby gave the winner a drink on the house and congratulated him. Rissa looked around for his wife, but didn't see anyone else paying attention to him. Probably on his own. And he was a shifter. She was close enough to see the gold rings around the man's irises. She wondered how many shifters she'd looked in the eye and never noticed before. If Mays hadn't told her about that characteristic, she still wouldn't have known who was a shifter and who wasn't. The bartender set her water next to her. After the abundant amount of time spent in slots recently, she had this area of the casino memorized down to the stains in the carpet. Maybe she'd see what the rest of the place held. On her way out of the busy area, she noticed a side door open and a man in a suit walk out. He went to the winner and shook his hand. Rissa stopped to watch. They wouldn't give the winner cash on the floor, would they? She wondered how much he won. That thought reminded Rissa of the last text she received from Kiva. One big time. Champagne when you get off tonight. The winner followed the guy in the suit through the same side door. They were probably going to cut him a check for his winnings. Since Kiva only played the slot machines, Rissa figured this was where she was last seen. Actually, that wasn't true. If she went into the office to get her check, then maybe someone inside would remember if there was anything off or different about that night. Rissa sat at a slot machine next to the door. She put a few nickels in to make it look good. Twenty-five minutes later, no one sign of the winner. And no one had come out of the door. Maybe the lucky guy left through another door. 
She was tired of waiting. Time to look around for a while. She strolled the main aisle, passing blackjack and poker tables and other games she had no idea how to play. As she passed another slot area, she heard a woman scream and turned to catch a woman jumping up and down, her machine flashing a red light. Others around her glanced and smiled. Just like the other winner, she didn't seem to have friends or family with her. Rissa started to move on when she saw the same waitress as before gave this winner a drink too. The waitress stuck around, making Rissa wonder if she was waiting for the guy in the suit to collect this winner too. Rissa wondered if she could follow them when he did show up, and maybe she could sneak in. She'd have to time it just right. As she waited, others congratulated the woman. The waitress looked at her watch and frowned. Seemed the office wasn't as on the ball with this winner. Commotion R caught Rissa's attention. A man sitting next to the winning machine was holding the woman who'd won by the arm. He asked if she was all right. She said yes, that she was feeling a bit lightheaded from all the excitement. Rissa saw the golden circle around her irises. Seemed shifters were really damned lucky. And a whole bunch of them seemed to get lucky at this casino. Maybe she should try harder since she was part shifter. Small part anyway. The waitress took her other arm. The two started toward the door. Finally it opened, and the same man came out. Rissa hurried to them, if she could just talk to the guy for a second. Excuse me sir? Rissa shouted. He helped the woman through the door. Sir. Wait a second. His eyes met hers as the door closed. Since he'd seen her, he'd open the door for her. Or so she figured. Except he didn't. She knocked and no one answered. The knob didn't turn. With a sigh, Rissa leaned against a slot to wait. Twenty minutes later, she'd had enough. This had been a complete waste of time. Not to mention a headache had crept its way in. She was close to the hotel side of the casino and could get aspirin in the gift shop. Granted, it would be overpriced, but she'd rather pay a dollar more than have a migraine. Making her way through, she saw a few more shifters playing the tables. Most people didn't look at her, but the shifters did. She wondered if that was because they sensed her and knew her recently discovered secret. Stepping into the hotel's lobby, Rissa was wowed by the opulence of it all. Then she saw Frank Bonaparte. Forget the headache. She followed him to see where he was going. Heading toward the gift shop, lucky break for her, she stayed on his trail. To her disappointment, Bonaparte passed the shop and disappeared down a hall she hadn't noticed before. She leaned against the wall next to the shop. She pressed on the icon for the mirror application on her phone, then tilted it sideways so she could see down the hall. The way was dim, the only light far down, in front of a single elevator. The hall ended in another door that looked identical to so many other doors around the building. Bonaparte pressed the elevator button, and the doors immediately slid open. He disappeared inside. She wondered where that elevator went to make it set off by itself, practically hidden. A male employee wearing a casino shirt walked out of the shop. She jumped on the opportunity to get an answer. Excuse me, she said, stepping away from the wall. The guy turned to her. Can you tell me where this elevator goes? He smiled and said, guest rooms like the other elevators. It's closer for those in the office to use if there's an emergency or something. It's not as nice as the others. We encourage everyone to use the main elevators. I can walk with you there, he offered. Oh, thank you, but no. I'm waiting for a phone call I'd like to keep private. Then I'll be on my way. Thank you for your help. You're welcome, ma'am. Have a good evening. He turned and left her alone. Rissa leaned against the wall again, thinking. This was probably nothing. As she stepped toward the gift shop and her much-needed pain reliever, the door at the end of the hall opened. If the employee was correct, that door went into the office. She tipped her phone sideways again to spy down the aisle. Outside the door, she saw the man, the first winner, being helped by two other men, both in suits, into the elevator. He looked woozy and pale. 
she realized that the two men who were helping the winner had to be come back down to return to the office. That would her chance to get in. Only problem was getting all the way down the hall before the office door closed. May said shifters had superhuman speed. Maybe she did too. She was about to find out. The two men were laughing when they came out of the elevator. Rissa took a deep breath, waited a beat looking for anyone watching her, then sprinted down the hall. Consciously pushing her legs, she flew down the hall. She was moving so fast, she startled herself. Her fingers easily wrapped around the knob before the door closed. She peeked in to find the men had left the room, clearly using one of the doors across from her. She slid inside. She was standing in another hall, shorter than the one on the other side of the door, hearing voices, not from nearby, she paused to assess the area. A few doors were along the short hallway. The first was a restroom. She was just moving to another door when she heard a noise. Her senses went into overdrive. She needed to hide. Now. Rissa glanced at the door before her, the only option she could think of, she opened the door, hurried in, then quietly closed the door. Footsteps passed by. While she waited for them to pass again, a strange antiseptic smell wafted up from the door's threshold, stinging her nose. When the coast was clear, she felt along the wall and flipped a switch. She was in a small storage room with office supplies. Past the pens, reams of paper and staples were plastic tubing needles, flat plastic bags, cotton balls, and a small brown container. Picking up the brown bottle, she unscrewed the lid and took a sniff. There wasn't any odor to the white power filling the container. She took one of the flat collection bags and poured a sample of the powder into it. She'd see if she could get the forensic lab to find out what it was. Dropping the bag into her pocket, she switched off the light, ready to explore more rooms. She twisted the doorknob and voices came down the hall. She froze. One of the voices she recognized, winner number two, the female. Then she heard them going into another room. She faintly heard one person telling someone else to lie down. Just when Rissa was leaning forward to hear better, footsteps came toward the room Rissa was in. She was so busted. Crap. Chapter 14 Rissa The footsteps stopped and the door opened. Rissa pressed herself against the wall behind the entrance. The light came on. The door blocked her view of the other side of the room, where the storage bin sat. Rissa leaned forward to see what the woman was doing. She couldn't tell much, but the woman was at the far end of the supplies where the medical goods were stacked. She had a long piece of tubing and a liquid collection bag. Rissa leaned back as the woman grabbed cotton balls. Shortly after, the light went off and the door closed. She sucked in a quiet breath. She hadn't breathed the entire time the woman was in there. She'd had enough surprises today to last a year. Home called to her, but she wanted to get the powder analyzed ASAP. She'd drop it off first, then go home. Turned out getting from the office to the hall to her car was event-free. One thing intrigued Rissa though. On her way out, in yet another slot area, there was another winner. The same waitress was in the room, talking with the winner. Maybe after Rissa found Kiva, she'd come back and try her luck. For now, she'd had more than enough of this place. At the station, Rissa parked in her assigned spot and headed inside. It was after five o'clock, and most of the administrative workers were gone for the day. Sometimes she wished she worked a simple eight to five job, but that would never happen. She'd be bored after a single day of sitting behind a desk. She'd always been one to get out and do something. Sitting to read or watch TV wasn't her thing. This job was perfect for her, as she could work as long as she wanted and then go home and crash to wake the next day and do something different than the day before. Turning down the hall to the police lab, she nearly crashed into the lead lab tech Nathan Spears. Rissa, Nathan said, his hands on her upper arms to keep from crashing into her, good to see you. It's been a while. She kept her slight embarrassment under control. Nathan had asked her out several times and she'd turned him down each time, giving late work hours as an excuse. He was cute in his own way and she liked him, but she wasn't into dating people she worked with. She'd learned that the hard way. 
it has been a while. Hope everything is good with you. He chuckled. It is. I see you're putting in more of those long hours. Yeah, I'm working on a bit of a personal case, she told him. Oh, that's right. Your friend is missing, isn't she? Concern registered on his face. Yeah, that's why I'm here actually. She pulled the collection bag of white powder from her pocket. I was hoping you could tell me what this is. At that moment, she realized he was probably going home for the day. Damn. She hated waiting. Nathan took the packet from her. He pulled the top open and sniffed. Well, I can tell you what it's not because it has no scent. But that probably doesn't help much, does it? She shook her head. No, it doesn't. I'll tell you what, he looked at her and smiled, I'll get this going right now. Rissa smiled, even though she heard the unspoken words to his statement, if you go out with me. That would be great, Nathan. Thank you so much. If she was giving him a date out of this, she was getting everything out of it she could. Call me when you know. Even if it's past midnight. Okay. Translation, don't go home until you have an answer. He laughed. I will, Rissa. I know a great little cafe that has the best gumbo in New Orleans. We'll have to check it out. She softened a bit. Thanks. I love gumbo. She headed back to her office. After answering all the emails in her box, she sat back and sighed. The sun was about to set, and she needed something to eat. Time to head home. Climbing the stairs to her third floor apartment, Rissa flipped through her keyring, searching for the silver one. Inside, Rissa slipped her shoes off, then pulled a box dinner from her freezer and popped it into the microwave. From the fridge, she pulled out the green tea she'd brewed yesterday. She'd read that the beverage helped with brain activity and lowered the risk of cancer. But tomorrow, she was sure that a new study would be out that countered that one. She thought about Mays. She hated that he'd left, but he wasn't a law enforcement person. He couldn't be expected to handle the stress the job created. It was a good thing that he walked away. Now she wouldn't have to worry about his safety. When she agreed to his coming along, she hadn't thought anything would happen that would be dangerous. Not like this. Taking a civilian into these types of situations was against policy, but he was a trained security specialist, so she felt confident he wouldn't get himself killed. The microwave beeped, telling her the meal was ready. After sitting with a steaming bowl of rice and chicken in front of her, she checked her phone for any missed texts or messages. She was hoping the chief made headway with getting a warrant or information to raid the laboratory. She still hadn't figured out what Lupin was doing there. He apparently left the briefcase behind for a reason. What was in it, she wondered. The first bite of her lean meal made her wish she had another bowl of gumbo from the small cafe earlier. She thought about the attorneys she met there. Didn't May say they were witches? Or were they vampires? No, they said vampires had been seen in the city. Specifically, the nightclub owned by Lupin. Vampires. Who would have guessed? She learned not even 12 hours ago that she was part shifter with amazing abilities that she sorta knew she already had. So many questions in her life were answered by that one fact. Now, should she even wonder if vampires were real? Why not? Dumping the rest of her microwave dinner in the trash, she made for the shower. It was time to meet her first vampire. Chapter 15 Rissa Rissa strolled into the casino's nightclub and found a dark place on the side to observe. First rule in undercover work was to know your surroundings. If you needed to make a quick escape, you knew where to go. Or if just needing to use the restroom. The club was packed, which was a bit surprising for a weeknight. Then again, this was New Orleans. The city had its own type of people, its own way of doing things. A waitress asked if she'd like a drink. She declined. With little food in her stomach, alcohol would go straight to her head. She adjusted her dress and headed toward a small empty table. When she'd pulled the red outfit from the closet, her eyes teared up. Several months ago, 
she and Kiva had gone shopping specifically for something sexy for her. Being on the police force and addicted to work, looking like a hottie, had never been high on Rissa's list. Kiva decided, it was time for best friend to find a love life. She dragged Rissa to the mall and they'd spent hours going in and out of fancy shops, eating pizza, and people watching. Kiva had a specialness about her that drew attention from pure strangers. People across street would turn to her and smile for no reason it seemed. Her soul was good. It was like everyone knew it. Kiva loved every person and every animal she came across. If the world had more people like her, the planet would be worth something. Inside the club, the DJ kicked the music up a notch and sweaty bodies on the dance floor thrashed and moved to the frenzied beat. The air itself vibrated. A hand pressed against her shoulder. Rissa's instincts were to grab and flip the person over her back. But she restrained those trained reflexes. Thankfully. She didn't want to cause a scene when she was trying to blend in. Would you like to dance, a male voice said in her ear. She really didn't want to but thought, what the hell? She could study those on the floor better if she were among them. Bodies crammed against one another, heat hovering just over the heads of the crowd. The floor shook with stomping feet as well as pulsing music. Her eyes latched onto a pair of violet eyes through the crowd. Her heart missed a beat. The man was gorgeous with his dark curly hair. She didn't see a gold ring around his irises, so he wasn't a shifter. The throng between them broke their connection. Along the perimeter of the floor, two levels of tables were filled with people. Most were drinking and laughing, while a group of three men and one stunning woman on an upper platform studied the crowd. Chills ran down her back. Senses were on alert. A hand slid over her thigh, around to her lower stomach. The splayed fingers spread from below her sternum. A hard body pressed against her back. May I have this dance? In her ear, a smooth deep baritone voice slid over her. A shudder she couldn't suppress racked her. The man holding her to him chuckled. He knew he affected women and reveled in it. She'd teach him about copping a feel from her. She pulled away and spun around, ready to throw an uppercut. A mirthful violet gaze met hers. It was him. They man with the violet eyes. His fingers wrapped around her wrist in mid-swing. He was eerily fast. Either way, he had her attention. His hand snaked around her waist again and hauled her closer. A bit feisty, aren't we beautiful? Her eyes narrowed. Only when others are rude. She smiled. He threw his head back and laughed. That's when she saw his teeth. Vampire. Be careful what you wish for, was her only thought. And he was hitting on her. Her senses were nearly in overload. Something about him was magnetic, drawing her to him. She recognized the affect, but it was hard to deny him. She had the burning desire to please him, to do whatever he wanted. Was this some power vampires had over humans? But she wasn't entirely human. She was able to control her actions. This must have surprised him. You're quite interesting, my little vessel. His eyes held hers. What are you? She laughed. What do you think I am? Best tactic when having no idea what the other person was talking about was to play coy. Fake it until you get it. His head tilted but he said nothing. Taking her hand, he led her off the floor. Normally, she wasn't worried about being alone with a man. Her combat skills were far from shabby. But with a vampire, she wasn't so sure. They walked up the two levels of partygoers, toward the elite-looking group of men, and the one woman she'd noticed earlier. He was part of them. Yes, she could see that. Expensively dressed, a sense of air and privilege about him. Please, he said, join us for a bit. He motioned for her to slide into the half-circle booth next to another man, who didn't even look at her. I'd rather sit on the outside, she said. He chuckled but agreed and slid in first. As soon as she settled on the end, up walked Jeffers Lupin. Adrenaline spiked in her system. Lupin inhaled deeply then looked down on her. Miss Belgrande? My how you change up nicely for the night. 
He pushed her farther into the booth, scooting her between himself and the vampire. One of the original men on the other end got up and left, leaving the couple and the three of them. Well, Sandor, Lupin said talking to the violet-eyed vampire, I see you've met my new friend Rissa Belgrande. Miss Belgrande, the vampire said, I'm Sandor Hoosman. Very nice to meet you. He brought her hand to his lips. To kiss. Or so she thought. Instead, he flipped her hand over, exposing her tender wrist and the veins running beneath the skin. He smiled, showing fangs, then gently kissed the heel of her hand. She snatched her arm back, not happy at his obvious attempt to freak her out. Lupin laughed. Miss Belgrande has recently learned of others who live in this world beside humans, the shifter said. Her head snapped around. How did he know that? Only a few people were aware of that. Including Angelina. Shit. She knew her cover would be blown. Why hadn't she remembered that? A waitress appeared from nowhere. Would you like something to drink, sir? Yes, Lupin said. A round of drinks for everyone. And Miss Belgrande's drink is on the house. The waitress wrote on her notepad. On the house, yes, sir. She hurried away. That's kind of you, Mr. Lupin, Rissa said, but I can pay for my own drinks. Please, Lupin cooed, call me Jeffers. He slid his arm onto the cushion top behind her, turning his body toward her to block the view of the dance floor. Normally, she would have an acquaintance call her Rissa, but this asshole would call her Miss Belgrande until the day she died. Actually, that's Officer Belgrande, she corrected him. She glared at the vampire who was scooting closer to her. He placed his hand on her leg. Sandor, miss, I mean Officer, Belgrande is one of New Orleans' finest. Though I must say she looks much better in civilian clothing. His eyes stopped at her cleavage. Rissa adjusted uncomfortably in her seat. Taking a break on searching for your friend, he asked. Behind them, the same door Lupin came out of, the waitress now exited. She came around to the table, and passed out red shots to the couple on the other side of the booth, and one to the vampire next to her. Hers and Lupin's were clear. Just as wordlessly, she left down the tears toward the dance floor. Lupin lifted his small glass. To new friends. Sandor raised his. The man and woman on the other side slammed back their drinks with no attention to her or the men on each side of her. She lifted her glass and tossed it back. She came up coughing. Damn, it had been forever since she had alcohol to drink. Fueled with liquid courage, she picked up Sandor's hand on her leg and dropped it on his own. I'm not that kind of girl. God, how stupid did that sound? Who cared? It was a freaking vampire next to her. Sharing her blood was not on her to-do list for tonight. In fact, what the hell was she thinking when deciding to go to a nightclub? She was so out of her realm of comfort. Kiva was the dancing queen. Not her. Her best friend was the one to make sure she didn't become a workaholic recluse. She missed Kiva so much, it hurt. The vampire laughed at her audacity. The gorgeous man probably wasn't used to being turned down. She refused to look into his eyes, remembering how they hypnotized her on the floor. Sandor brushed her hair off her shoulder, exposing her neck to him. That was it. She'd had enough of their unwelcomed advances. She stood, knocking the table to the side. I'm leaving now. Lupin, I'd like to say it was a pleasure, but of course it wasn't. He moved for her to get out. She didn't even want to look back at them. When she reached the exit, she stumbled. Damned heels. A man grabbed her arm to steady her. Are you okay, miss? Do you need a driver? Thank you, no. I haven't been drinking, she lied, it was just one drink after all. It's the shoes. I shouldn't have worn those shoes. She stepped out into night and took a deep breath. The phone in her clutch vibrated, signaling a text message. Who was sending her posts this late? On her way to the car, she pulled her phone out and pushed buttons to unlock the phone and get to the text. For a second, her head spun. She fell against a car, twisting her ankle. Ow hell. She slid the damned shoes off, wanting to throw them across the parking lot. The world stopped spinning and she straightened. 
She noted the phone in her hand and remembered that she had a text. The screen said the message was from Nathan in forensics. He had an answer for her already. She definitely owed him for this. Though a date, she shuddered. Now if it were May's, she pushed that thought away. She'd read it when she got in her car and could get off her unsteady legs. Rissa clicked her key fob to find her car in the next row. Her vision was blurry. Was she getting sick? Reaching her car door, she finally pushed the icon to bring up the message from Nathan. The screen had only a few words, concentrated flunitrazepam, date rape drug. Rissa fell against her driver's door. Oh shit. She wondered, why in the hell would that drug be in the office of a casino? Then she remembered the first winner, as he was literally dragged into the elevator in the hall by the gift shop. Then the second winner, who was woozy shortly after the waitress handed her a drink. Oh God. Her mind put it all together, including her own current condition, her drink had to be spiked. A drink on the house my ass. But why would a poker club want to drug winners? What was going on? She pulled the door to her car open and fell into the seat. With a little strength left in her, she yanked the door closed then sat back in the seat. A sound came from the dark passenger seat. Leaving so soon. Glowing violet eyes locked onto hers. Chapter 16 Rissa Rissa woke up with a headache that seemed to split her head in half. Damn. She needed pain relief. The ground below her was hard and hurt the arm she was lying on. She tried to move and realized her hands and ankles were bound. That snapped her out of the grogginess in her brain. Her last memories played in her mind. She was drugged in the nightclub, made it to her car, but the vampire was already inside waiting for her. She relaxed her body, knowing fighting would do her no good. She quieted her heartbeat to listen to her surroundings, leaving her eyes closed so anyone watching wouldn't notice she was awake. Action was rampant. Boots stomping on the concrete floor she lay on, rolling wheels, probably carts hauling things around and shouting voices giving directions to others. The slight echoes told her she was in a large space, probably a warehouse since the floor didn't have a covering. The last warehouse space she remembered was in the laboratory Lupin visited earlier. Her eyes sprang open. Was she there now? Sure enough, she was the concrete floor, the action going on around her. She lay in the back next to the entrance she'd stood in when she saw the men leave the container with the women. At the front of the warehouse, outside the garage doors, a cargo van and a refrigerated box truck awaited. Both were backed up to the doors as if ready to be loaded. The door from the inside hallway opened, and a man rolled out a cart loaded with full plastic collection bags. Bags like those in the supply room at the casino, and that the lab used when she saw techs filling them with blood. The tech loaded the cart into the back of the refrigerator truck. Voices she recognized came through the ruckus. I'm surprised how much blood you've collected in such a short time, Sander Hoosman said. How did you do it? It's the perfect plan, Lupin said. Hoosman asked, how does no one realize what you're doing? After we find our target shifter, one who is alone, we drug their drink before they are taken to the office. They pass out and have no memory. When they awaken, they remember feeling sick and think they still are. We hand them a check and take them to their hotel room, or they rest on the sofa until they're feeling better. The shifters have no idea you drain their blood during that time? The vampire asked. No, Lupin continued, shifters heal quickly and by the time the drug wears off, their blood is fully restored. They're good to go. You should come by to see it in action. Maybe next time, Hoosman said. I have too many anxious vampires waiting on this delivery. I need to be there. The vampire then handed Lupin a briefcase. One million as agreed. Do you wish to count it? Hoosman asked. Of course not, Sandor. We're partners. I trust you. Hoosman let out a loud laugh. Never a good idea to trust a vampire. A condescending smile spread across Lupin's face. I have what you desire most. Shifter blood. If you wish to have more, then you will not screw me over, will you? 
Gooseman didn't respond to the shifter's haughtiness. Speaking of desired things, he said, looking around, where is my little police officer? Adrenaline spiked Riss's heartbeat. He meant her. Why are you interested in her? Lupin asked. Except for her blood, of course. Gooseman laughed. I'll be doing more than drinking from that one. She'll be my new diversion. A challenge. I bore of my current one. Disgust churned Riss's stomach. She'd rather kill herself. From somewhere, a group of women were herded into the warehouse. Each looked emaciated and barely able to walk. To her surprise, the female winner from the casino headed the line. Rissa studied the group, recognizing faces from the missing person's wall at the station. Wait. No way. Were her eyes playing tricks or was that really Kiva? She opened her mouth to call her, but instead managed a hoarse whisper. Kiva. At that moment, Kiva tripped to the floor. One of the men escorting them kicked her, then picked her up and carried her to the cargo van. A flood of emotions swept Rissa away. She'd found her best friend. Tears stung her eyes. It was too much to hold back after this long. Now Rissa had to find a way to get Kiva and herself out of there. In the back of the van, the women were being tied up. Why, Rissa didn't know. The women didn't look capable of standing, much less fighting back. Ah, the blood slaves, the vampire said. He licked his lips. And they are all visually enticing. You've done well with them, Jeffers. Are they from the casino also? Some, but not all, Lupin replied. A few are shifters we came across. Others are from the casino. Winners, he said with a laugh. Hoosman stalked toward Rissa. Reaching her, he knelt and brushed hair from her face. Here you are, my crime-fighting donor. Good to see you awake before I drain you for the first time. He smiled, his fangs shining in the warehouse lighting. He grabbed her upper arms to sit her up. Her dress was hiked high on her legs, barely covering the important parts. The vampire stood, pressing her body against his, his mouth against her neck. His tongue snaked out, tracing the artery's outline. His fingers squeezed around her arms and his teeth sank into her neck. The pain lasted less than a second. Her lower stomach tightened and released, sending a pleasant sensation through her body. She shuddered from the rush. Her mind registered that the feeling was created by the vampire drinking from her, that she didn't actually enjoy his taking her blood. He'd compelled the perception onto her. Her head started feeling light, as though she was floating. She was so tired. Her eyelids closed but she was still awake, hearing all. The clicking of heavy footsteps on the concrete drew her attention. Damn, the vampire uttered. Damn, Lupin echoed, though he sounded so far away. Anger filled his voice. Was it because of the owner of the footsteps? This was a new person, she smelled his scent and didn't recognize it. Hello, Ricardo, Lupin growled. The newcomer laughed. You don't sound glad to see me, Jeffers. Hoosman dropped Rissa like a doll onto the floor. He'd found something more interesting. Which was good. Rissa felt drained and her heart had faltered more than once while he drank from her. Introduce us, Jeffers, the vampire said. Sandor, this is Ricardo, a wizard, the shifter said with no emotion. Ricardo chuckled. I like to think of myself more like a warlock, but wizard will do. It is nice to finally meet you, Sandor. I've heard much about this agreement for trafficking blood. What do you plan to do with it all? I will sell it, of course. Shifter blood is worth a lot of money, especially after a vampire is addicted and can't get enough. Yes, I've heard that, Ricardo responded. I'll be tracking your success. I may want to start my own trade on the other coast if yours does well. Dangerous conniving and plotting filled the warlock's words. The vampire better watch his back. This Ricardo individual sounded deadly. Lupin shoved the briefcase toward Ricardo. Here, take the money and leave. I owe you one more payment, then I want you out of New Orleans. I don't care if the witch coven rules here. I don't want to see your face. Ricardo tittered. Not very friendly, Jeffers. 
I went out of my way to help you buy the casino, and now you resent my assistance. Your assistance, Lupin spit out, is barely worth the price, wizard. I refuse to help you with the island after I've made the last payment. Careful, Lupin, Ricardo drawled, after your last payment you will be useless to me. I don't usually keep unwanteds around. We'll see. A stench reached Riss's nose. Fear. She knew that smell. She'd picked up on it when chasing perps. You have your money, Ricardo. Please leave us to finish this exchange. Jeffers seemed agitated. Rissa could understand why, with the wizard nearby. Ricardo spun on his heel and walked toward the door going into the interior of the lab. Hoosman picked up Rissa and laid her in the back of the cargo van with the rest of the captive women. Driver, you know what to do. He closed the doors, leaving Rissa to her fate. A fate she didn't want out of. Now. Chapter 17 Rissa As Rissa lay in the back of the van, drained of most of her blood, she studied the women around her, her gaze coming to rest on Kiva. With strength from sheer determination, Rissa dragged herself next to her best friend then collapsed, exhausted. Kiva looked down at her. Geez, Rissa. Hate to say it but you look like shit. A laugh burst from Rissa's throat. Sorry to say, you don't look much better, Kiev, she joked. Kiva's laughter quickly turned to a sob. Rissa pulled herself up awkwardly. Kiva untied her hands, then she gathered Kiva into her arms. While Rissa had always been the strong one of the two, never letting the world get to her, Kiva had been the emotional one. Kiva let Rissa experience the human side of life that Rissa seldom let herself feel. In essence, Kiva was her other half, reminding Rissa that the world wasn't always bad. With Kiva in her arms, she rocked them both. It'll be okay, Kiva, Rissa said. No, it won't, she sobbed. You don't know what they do to the women they capture. I don't want to live. Rissa eyed the driver. If she could get to him, somehow make them crash, then the police would find them. In the dimness, her eyes met the driver's in the rearview mirror. The gold circles around the black center dashed her hopes. If he was a shifter, there would be no way she could sneak up on him or have any strength over him. They were not getting out of this. She let the hope she had die on the spot and squeezed Kiva closer to her. She needed to do some more thinking. Rissa let her body relax against the van side wall. She watched the world go by through the front windshield. Recognizing the buildings, she knew exactly where they were. She'd driven these streets almost half her life, first as a teen, then as an officer of the law. Maze's face popped into her mind. A sad smile crossed her face. The man had been a nice surprise in her monotone life. She regretted chasing him away. Maybe she wouldn't be in this predicament, if she hadn't. What she would do, if she could be on the island again. Talk about a paradise. She wondered how the place wasn't on any map she'd ever seen. Certainly Google would have it surveyed and online. Maybe Vivian's magic kept it hidden. Rissa had never experienced magic before that moment. How her gun safety clicked on even after she switched it off was creepy but it showed what kind of beings Vivian and the shifters were. The woman used nonviolent means to subdue Rissa. Quick or Maze could have easily taken her down with a body blow, but instead, Vivian simply deactivated the one device that could kill. The world could learn a lot from that group. She was getting tired again. The adrenaline that fueled her to reach out to Kiva was draining. Her arms felt heavy and her body was dead weight. The van slowed, and Rissa barely registered the marina's sign as it flashed in the window when the van turned. So they were shipping them out via ocean, instead of across land. Wise. Less chance of being caught. Her eyelids fluttered as she tried to remain awake, draining her blood had taken its toll on her. The van stopped and the back doors opened. Men crowded in to collect one of the women. She hated to think what would happen if these men had their way. But instead, the first man gently lifted a woman and comforted her when she cried out. Behind the gathered men, she noticed a makeshift triage center. The woman taken from the van was placed on a cot, and others assembled around her. 
Same for the next woman. What was going on? Were they making sure the women were okay before transporting them to wherever? She let out a relieved sigh and let her eyes close. Perhaps things would be better than they were in the hands of the vampires. Hands jostled her body, but she was too exhausted to fight them. She was lifted, and heat from the body holding her warmed her in the chilly night air. Don't worry, Officer Belgrande. We got you all now. You're safe, said another voice from nearby. She knew that voice. Quick. But how, where did? The man holding her called out for immediate help. She was lowered onto a cot inside a big tent. Inside, a low light shined from an electric lantern. She needs blood, the man said. Her heart rate is too slow. We're out, someone said. We didn't expect the women to be in such a bad state. She rolled her head toward the man who carried her, and used all the strength she had to open her eyes enough to see him. Hey, Detective Belgrande. Good to see you again, Quick said. She let out a croak. Her tongue stuck to the roof of her over-dry mouth when she tried to talk. Just rest, he said. I'll be right back. When he left, he swept back the tent flap to where it stayed open. She saw others helping the women who were in the van with her. They had food and water and blankets. Others provided comfort and support to the traumatized victims. It looked like an army of civilians there to help except she knew these people were shifters. All of them were here because of Quick and Maze. Maze hadn't abandoned her, after all. He went to the island to bring them all here. Her heart fluttered for a second. Such a weird feeling in her chest. Was she dying? Had the bastard vampire drained her too much? Quick entered the tent, a frown on his face. He squatted by her cot and brushed hair out of her face. Rissa. Can you hear me? he asked as he rolled up a sleeve. Her tongue licked her lips, but it did no good. Her body couldn't give up one drop of liquid. We're completely out of blood, he said, so I'm giving you some of mine. Wait, what? His blood? He's going to make her drink his blood? Whatever you're thinking, detective, it isn't that bad on your end, Quick said. He was rushing around pulling things she couldn't make out in the low light. A bee sting on the inside of her arm had her looking down. Quick had inserted a needle connected to a plastic tube into her skin and smoothed a piece of tape over it. Okay, Belgrande, just relax and you won't feel a thing. Whatever you hear, ignore it. I'll be fine. I'm a shifter. Quick pinched the center of the tube, then inserted the other end of the tube with another needle into his wrist. When he released the pinch, the tube filled and flowed toward her arm. Quick winced. Sound at the tent's flap opening drew her attention. Maze. With a look of surprise on his face. Rissa, here you are. My god quick, Maze whispered as he came to a kneel by her side. He brushed hair and wetness from her face. Don't move. Any movement is painful. If she had to give an award for best superheroes, these two would be her winners. Her body felt better already. Lungs breathed easier. Her heart no longer weak. Her mind told her to stop thinking and rest. Trusted friends had her and they would be all right. Her consciousness faded into blackness. Chapter 18 Rissa Rissa stretched and opened her eyes. She was in an unfamiliar room, but it felt comfortable. A woman dressed in all white, sitting in a wicker rocker looked up at her. Officer Belgrande, you're awake. She came over and placed two fingers on Rissa's wrist then looked at her watch. Rissa realized she was a nurse, even though they were not in a hospital. Good pulse, she said. Strong. I think you're going to be just fine. Would you like anything to drink? She may have asked, but it wasn't really question. She picked up a glass on the nightstand and put an arm behind Rissa to lift her back. Drink all of this. It will help your body rid itself of any remaining toxins. When finished, the nurse took the glass and set it on the stand. Where am I? Rissa asked. The woman smiled. You're on the island. Miss Vivian will be here. 
A knock came from the door, and a familiar face peeked inside the room. I heard voices, Vivian said. Yes, please come in, Miss Devereaux, the nurse said. Vivian crossed the floor to sit on the side of her bed. How are you feeling, Rissa? Rissa took stock of herself. She felt well considering she thought she'd end a bag of bones with little blood in her body. Better than expected. Thanks to Quick and Maze. How is Quick? She remembered him giving her a direct blood transfusion. He saved her life. Anything she could do to help him, she would. Anything. Vivian laughed. He's great. His shifter abilities healed him a while ago. But now there's someone here to see you. She stood at the same time Maze poked his head through the doorway. May I come in? Vivian walked toward the door. I was just leaving, Maze. She's all yours. His eyes met hers and she smiled. It was a bit embarrassing to be so weak in front of him, but she'd been through hell and didn't care that she looked like shit. She deserved that right. Maze drew his brows down. Don't worry about what you look like or whatever you're fretting over, woman. You've been through a lot. She snorted. For once, we agree. Maze dragged a chair closer to her bed. Where are we? she asked. We're in a guest room next to the med clinic. Since you were in better shape than the rest of the women, the doctor had you put here. The others need more attention and doctoring, I guess. The others. She remembered Kiva. Kiva, how is she? She's doing fine. All the women will be all right, thanks to you. Me, she said. I was just as helpless as they were in the back of the van. Yeah, but without you, no one would have been there to rescue all of you, Mays told her. Her mind recalled the events. It was quick in you last night. How did you know? What happened? Mays chuckled. First off, it wasn't last night but several nights ago. You've been out for a while. That surprised her. Several nights. Mays continued. After I left the station that day, I went back to the island to get Quick and a group of trained shifters ready to raid the laboratory where the women were kept. When we got there after dark, the van and truck were there, as was Lupin. When we realized Lupin was selling shifter blood to the vampires along with female blood slaves, we knew we'd discovered something big. Then you showed up, unconscious, in the vampire's arms. You scared the shit out of me. Rissa smiled. Sorry about that. Lupin was using a drug to knock out others, to collect their blood without their knowledge. Seems I got a drink of the drug too. Did you get Lupin? We got him, but the vampire and Ricardo got away. We'll deal with them later. Lupin was the main target. What's going to happen to him? she asked. Shifter justice is swift. We don't drag it out for years like others do. May smiled at his dig at the human law proceedings. Don't make me hurt you, Shifter, Rissa said with a grin. Maze laughed and continued. Anyway, Lupin was found guilty of trafficking, blood and women. And since he was a prosecutor before all this, the Shifter Council is going back to review everything he did to see if there were any criminal actions in any of the cases he handled. His success record was a little iffy. Is there a Shifter jail too? Rissa asked. There is, but Lupin won't be going there, May said, a bit of sadness tinted his words. Why not? Rissa asked. He sighed. After the trial when he was being taken from the building to a vehicle for transportation, a group of vampires attacked. That was the end of Lupin. Rissa gasped. My God, why? As far as the vampires are concerned, Lupin stole from them. They had advanced him bunch of money for goods they wouldn't receive. That's the kind of justice they mete out. Wow, Rissa said, sounds a bit harsh. To be bodily torn apart. It does, but when you mess with vampires. Maze shuddered. You won't find me taking that chance. Me either. Her stomach growled. They laughed. How about some food? Maze asked. Rissa nodded. That would be great. A steak sounds awesome. Maze stood. We can do that. One rare steak coming up. Chapter 19
Rissa. Rissa looked around at the outdoor seating restaurant at the beach area. When May said he lived and worked on an island, she hadn't thought he meant it was something more like a five-star luxury resort. Damn, she could handle living here too. Probably not much crime for her to take care of. Stealing seashells or skinny dipping were probably the biggest offenses, if she had to take a guess. This is fabulous, Maze, she said. He shrugged like it was no big deal. Maybe not to him. Yeah, it's home. It has its hang-ups, occasionally. Rissa snorted. Right. You forget I'm from the city. I know all about hang-ups. Mays pulled out a chair for her at a table along the rail overlooking the water. Thank you. She took in a deep breath of the fresh air. Her body was still a bit sore from her recent activity with vampires and shifters. The nurse had brought her clothing and shoes from the local shop that fit her perfectly. With the lightweight capris and pullover top, she felt like she was on vacation. Oh shit. What? Mays looked around his brows drawn down. What's wrong? She almost laughed. Nothing big. I just remembered I need to call the office. The chief probably thinks I'm dead. Ah, Mays replied, I talked to him the other day. I told him you needed a few days off to recuperate. He was more than fine with that. She nodded and looked Mays over as he read the menu, wondering if she and Mays were headed toward something. She knew she had feelings for him. Feelings she'd never felt before. It was clear he felt something as well. Gorgeous with muscles on muscles. And that grin, it made her feel things. Footsteps sounded behind her. Maze looked up with a smile, so she released the breath she held and willed her heart to slow. She wondered if she'd ever fully relax after the last few days' events. Good to see you out of the infirmary, Miss Belgrande, Vivian said. Please call me Rissa. Vivian nodded. I hope you plan to stay with us a few more days. We have plenty of room. Rissa hadn't thought about staying. She'd done nothing but work for so long she'd feel weird sitting around all day. That sounded really good though. The beach, sitting around. But still, could she do that? What about her life? Kiva. We'll have to see. Wonderful, Vivian said as she stepped back. I need to check on some things. Enjoy your breakfast. Rissa watched as Vivian stopped at different tables and talked with others. She seems like a nice lady, Rissa said. Yeah, May said, she'll make a good replacement. Replacement? Rissa asked. She's the heiress to the island. Replacement for who? May stared down at the menu on the table. She was killed in the city not too long ago. Rissa's head snapped toward him. Killed. In New Orleans. Why don't I know about that? Actually, Adriana died when she reached the island. She was shot on her way here. She remembered thinking earlier about a call to the harbor concerning gunshots, but nothing came of it. Nobody was there when the police showed up. It was at the waterfront where the boat was tied up, wasn't it? She asked. He nodded. We didn't find evidence beyond a few drops of blood on the dock. Do you know who shot her? At that moment, the waitress arrived at their table with glasses of water. She took their order and Rissa's mind returned to the cold case. What happened? Who shot her? She asked again. Mays looked around the restaurant. There were a few patrons at distant tables, eating pancakes and cereal. It's a long story. The first part anyway, May said. First part? The part where Quick is a convicted killer. Rissa jumped to her feet. What? He grabbed her wrist and pulled her down. The others had stopped eating and stared at her. He's innocent. It was a setup, Mays whispered. Setup how? Her mind was spinning with legal implications. Mays frowned. Lupin and some others framed him for murdering his parents. You're shitting me, she responded. He sighed. No, and I don't want to talk about it here. Not many know about it. Rissa leaned forward, putting elbows on the table. What does that have to do with the previous owner getting shot? 
Maze cleared his throat and said, let's just say for now the bullet that hit Adriana wasn't meant for her. Rissa sat back in her chair. They were gunning for quick. He has a bounty on his head. Maze nodded. And Lupin's involved, she asked. Prosecutor at the time, Maze answered. She wove her fingers together and rested her chin on them. I believe it. Their breakfast arrived and both remained quiet, eating and contemplating their own thoughts. Hers centered around the injustice of an innocent and others that Jeffers Lupin screwed over. She was sure there was more than just quick. I need to get back to the office, she said, finishing the waffles with chocolate chips and syrup. I thought you were going to stay a couple days. I'd like to. Mays let his sentence remain uncompleted. To what? Rissa said, trying not to smile. She liked where she thought he might be headed. At least, where she hoped he might be heading. Mays drank down his entire glass of water. He cleared his throat. I'd like to make sure you're healed before you jump back into all that, he said. Of course, she replied. An idea came to her. I feel great. How about you stick around and help me with things? Help you? He asked. Yeah, you know, she mumbled, we wouldn't be on official police work. Just looking around on our own. Sorta. His blossoming smile rocked her. Sorta. Right. Chapter 20 Rissa Sitting at her office desk, Rissa groaned when she looked at her email and the number of messages on her desk. You'd think she'd been gone for a month. The bullpen area where her desk sat was an open space with several others at their desks. Privacy was an issue. There simply was none. Many of the others welcomed her back, though she felt like she hadn't been gone. Hey Belgrande, one of the men called out. She thought he heard May scoff. She raised a brow at him, then turned toward the room. Yeah, Murphy. What, she replied. You should talk with the chief, he said. I heard he was getting a warrant to search a casino. Thought it might be your case. Rissa was out of her seat and on her way to the chief's office before Murphy finished his sentence. She knocked and stuck her head in. Chief, you got a search warrant for Lupin? Hey, Belgrande. Good to see you back, he replied. Well, I'm unofficially back. Unless you got a warrant. Finally got it done, the chief said. Not sure what took so long. Maybe Lupin's reach was further than we thought. When can we go, she asked. The chief looked at his watch. I sent Preston to oversee the crew since you were out. If you hurry, you can be in on it. Lupin's office. Thanks, she shouted as she spun and grabbed her keys from her desk. Let's go to the casino, Maze. At the casino, she parked out front with a myriad of police cars and unmarked vehicles. Some were just going in, so hopefully they hadn't missed much. Walking inside, Rissa couldn't believe the chaos. Men in uniform lined up to go through a door that led to the main offices. She was surprised how many people were vacating the area. Were they doing something illegal or afraid of the law for another reason? Mays stood behind her as they moved into the office. The secretaries were up in arms as their desks and files were overtaken. Rissa bypassed them and made for Lupin's space. Others were in the shifter's office, boxing up papers and pulling the computer. Rissa stepped behind the desk and opened a few drawers. The first side drawer held packs of beef jerky and a gun. She'd leave that for the forensics crew to handle. She pulled on the wide center drawer. Initially, she saw pens, pencils, some business cards, and toward the back, a key with a fob to a storage facility. A key card sat next to it. Her fingers slid the keyring and card into her palm. Turning her right side toward the window, she snuck the items into her pocket. Across the room, she noted May's breathing deeply. Maybe he was picking up on something humans couldn't. What you got, she asked. He exhaled. Nothing surprising, he said. Same vampires from the warehouse the other night. And lots of different perfumes. Figures. I can imagine women coming in and out for all kinds of nefarious reasons, Rissa commented. 
You ready to move on? Mays looked at her questioningly. That's it. You don't want to go through files or something? Nah, she said, we know about all this blood scandal. That's all that will be here. I'm not interested in that. What are you interested in? Mays asked. She pulled the key fob from her pocket. Let's find out, shall we? What's that? Well, I'm hoping it's a link to the past. She led them through those milling about out to her car. She scanned her phone's internet for the storage company's address on the key card. The address of the place was in a part of town that had been steadily declining over the years. When she stopped at the gate to the building, she placed the card on the reader, hoping it was all needed to get in. Bingo. The barrier slid to the right, opening. The handwritten number on the card told them the building and room number. Wasn't there an unspoken rule to not put your pin on the back of your debt card? The idiot rule. Oh well. Good thing for them. They parked in the small yellow-lined area and searched the buildings for sign numbers. Entering the door to the building, they looked for the suite number. Rissa looked at Mays. Is this legal, he asked. Nope, she answered. Not usable in court. Let's snoop. Rissa twisted the key in the padlock, and it popped open. Mays lifted the garage-type door then flipped on a switch. Boxes upon boxes were stacked on all three walls, taking up most of the middle. Names were written on the front of each box with a date. She opened a box and shuffled through the contents. This looks like a case file, Rissa explained. She pulled out official-looking papers and skimmed the wording. I think these are Lupin's files for those he prosecuted. They aren't recent. May started pulling the front row off boxes, setting them to the side. What are you doing? She didn't want a mess to clean up if someone questioned their credentials. He moved several more before answering. Here. He scooted dusty boxes forward. All with the name Alvarez, and dated about 20 years ago. Are these? Rissa let her question trail off since she knew the answer. These boxes were to the murder case against Quick Alvarez. If there was anything she could do to help Quick, she owed it to him. She couldn't do much, but her expertise was in investigating crimes. And if ever there was a crime, it was the conviction that Quick was a cold-hearted killer. Chapter 21 Rissa Rissa was astonished at what Mays pulled from the storage room. Was it normal for a prosecutor to keep all the files to his cases over the years? About 30 years, actually. Rissa popped off a cardboard lid to the first Alvarez box. Folders and paper-clipped papers packed the box. Dust had settled, making Rissa sneeze when she took out a thick folder. Case number F365958. The State of Louisiana versus Alvarez. Rissa flipped through arrest warrants, search and seizure warrants, subpoena after subpoena and various orders. She thought about reading the more important reports, but if what May said was true, and she had no reason to think it wasn't, it was all fabricated anyway. Look at this. Mays lifted a pile of papers in sheet protectors. He laid them out on the floor. Crime photos. With a quick glance, Rissa turned away and covered her mouth, swallowing the bile that wanted to rise. Through all her career in law enforcement, she'd never seen anything so brutal, so full of hate. When composed, she turned back to the pictures. Mays, whoever committed this crime was a very violent, very disturbed person. Mays nodded. That's how they tried to describe Quick, as a teenager with barely a bad bone in his body. She studied the photos with an analytical eye. I see there were two murder weapons. Both knives. No, Mays replied, they only showed one knife. She looked up at him. No. There are two distinct cut patterns. There were two knives. Mays took the photo from her hands and stared at it. Rissa pointed. The cuts on her vary in length slightly. This is characteristic of a butcher knife that gets wider the deeper it cuts. With stabbing, depths are different depending on the strength behind the cut. She handed him a close-up of the back of the male victim. In this photo, the cuts are exactly the same size. 
That tells me a knife with a blade having one width was used. Two different knives. Mays stared at that picture. His face was pale. You're right, he said. There were two knives. I remember now. She wondered if he was going to be sick. She looked around for something he could vomit in. Nothing but the boxes. Or their lids. These were shown to the jury, but no one said anything about the different cut sizes. These were just to show how gory and insane the attacker was, Mays replied, his voice was soft, like recalling the event was tearing him apart inside. Seriously, she asked. Who was the defense attorney? He shrugged. Some young guy the prosecution bullied around. She took back the close-up of the father. In the photo, the back side of his right hand was at the edge of the image. The knuckles were scraped and bloody. Did Quick's father pound on his mother before dying? Mays nodded. I saw his father beating up his mom before the man used a knife. But Quick hit his father, trying to get him to stop hurting his mom. And he trailed off pain in his eyes. Let me guess, she said, continuing for him, they blamed Quick for both. Mays turned away and opened another box. Rissa continued through the pictures. She came to a close-up of the female's neck with bruises that resembled strangulation marks. One of the bruises had an abnormal shape to it, a slight bend in the middle. Mays, are any of Quick's fingers bent or permanently injured in some way to make them not straighten? No, he answered, why? She showed him the image. These bruises are handprints. She dug back into stack to find the close-up that had the father's hand in the shot. See here, she said, pointing at the fingers. The father has a deformed ring finger, exactly like the photo shows. Did you see this used in the trial? No, he said. I do see it now that you mentioned it. I bet no one would have noticed it either, she said. Or if they did, it was suppressed. The hands are exceptionally large. See how the bruise covers the entire neck. Quick's hands weren't that big, still aren't, Mays commented. I wonder. She scanned through the pictures she hadn't seen yet. Here we go. What do you have, he asked. I was looking for a handprint for Quick. This one on the wall is smaller than those on the neck. Didn't see that one in court, Mays said. A half hour flew by as they went through the boxes of evidence. Rissa felt she had a good hold on the prosecution's side. She just needed to get Mays's version of what happened that night, to know the truth. Okay, this is enough. She rose and dusted off her pants. What now? He asked. Now we go back to the office and ask the chief for a warrant to search this room to make it legal. Who knows what else is in here? Mays nodded in agreement and put the lid on the box closest to him. From there, they stacked everything back in the original positions and headed out for the station. Chapter 22 Rissa At the precinct, Rissa knocked on the chief's door and granted entrance. Chief got a second? Need to talk to you, she said. The chief raised a brow and asked, You're officially still unofficially back, right? Rissa smiled at his playful banter. The chief was one of the greatest men she'd ever met. Not only was he honorable and a hard worker, he believed in liberty and justice for all. Which was becoming less and less the case in the age of big corporations and big money. She placed the key and card on his desk. I found this in Lupin's desk at his office during the search and seizure. I think we should get a warrant to check it out. He picked up the key fob and examined it. Who knows what could be in there? All kinds of old stuff. Better to check it out. Legally and all that. He smiled. You've already checked it out, haven't you? He accused. Maybe a bit. The chief sighed. All right, Spill. What did you find? The storage room is filled with boxes of his past prosecution cases. She paused. How did she get across that she was personally investigating a friend's past, which the police had no reason to be involved in? She'd have to tell him about the island and the shifters. And that wouldn't go over well. She'd get a one-way ride to an insane asylum. The chief interrupted her thoughts. 
prosecution cases before he bought the casino. She nodded. Haven't you ever wondered where he got the funds to do that? Her boss sighed. No, I haven't. Lupin is not of interest to me, except for his part in human trafficking. Damn it. She knew that would be his answer. Can we get the warrant anyway? There could be relevant evidence there. I didn't see everything. The chief scribbled a note on a piece of paper. I'll see what I can do if you tell me what's going through your head now. I have it on good authority that Lupin was dirty. He took and gave bribes to get convictions and was unethical in his decisions. He has a 99% win rate. That's crazy. She paused, debating if she should tell him about Quick. And the chief prompted. And well, she let out a breath. A long time ago, he convicted an innocent teenager. For murder. He straightened in his chair. She had his full attention now. A teenager? What happened? I don't have the full story yet. But it seems that the boy was trying to protect his mother from his father, who was trying to kill her. He jumped in with a knife and killed the father, but the mother was already dead at that point. Sounds like a defendable situation, he commented. Yeah, but I think Lupin withheld evidence that would prove the kid's innocence she said. I see. He leaned back in desk chair giving a loud long creak. What are your plans? I'm not sure I can get authorization to open an investigation. How much evidence do you have? Some, she started. From the case material in the storage room. He came down hard in his chair, a frown marring his face. That's what I thought. His voice told her he wasn't buying it. She continued quickly, I personally know the boy, now a man and a first-hand witness. They know the truth. Her boss's brow climbed his forehead. Is he on death row? Oh shit. She couldn't tell him Quick somehow got away. She'd like to know how Mays and Quick managed that. She couldn't lie to him. He's alive. It would be nice to clear him. He ran his hand over his buzz haircut. How long ago was this? About twenty years, she answered. I don't know, Belgrande. If I can get a judge to agree to open a case, it'll take a while. Then it dawned on her. She was dealing with shifters. There was no way she could bring them into the human court system and keep everything about them secret. Well, shit. She'd have to go on her own. This was so not good. Answers would be twice as difficult to get without the law backing her. What if I do more research on my own time to put together a strong case? He frowned again. You know I don't like that kind of thing, Belgrande. I don't want you getting into trouble. I can take care of myself. He shook his head. I can't control what you do on your personal time, Belgrande. And I can't bail you out if you're not on official police work. Remember that. Yes, sir. I'll remember. She was ready to jump out of her chair. So, how many personal days are you taking since you're officially not back now? He asked. This shouldn't take more than a couple days. She'd talk with those who worked the case to see what they could tell her. Worst case scenario would be not finding enough evidence to overturn the ruling. What harm could poking around do? Chapter 23 Rissa Is Chief Masterson in? Rissa said into the speakerphone on her desk. She gave Mays a tight-lipped smile. She wasn't completely hopeful. Small towns didn't always work well with big city police departments. This is Masterson. What can I do for you? The chief at Haven Police Department replied. Rissa continued, I'm Detective Rissa Belgrande with the New Orleans PD. We're doing great down here, sir, she politely replied. I'm revisiting a case in your town several years ago. Oh, you are now? He drawled. Which one would that be, darlin? We've had a lot of those over the years. Darlin? Yeah, this wasn't going to go well. This is the Alvarez case from about 20 years ago. The line was quiet for a minute. The boy who murdered his parents. 
Horrible case. Shocking. Why you interested in that? Well, sir, a few nights ago, Jeffers Lupin was arrested on human trafficking charges here in New Orleans. I'm researching his past to see if there are hints to previous misconduct. Listen here, Missy. Mr. Lupin is a respected person and prosecutor in my town. He did an outstanding job keeping our population safe by locking up troublemakers. His win to lose ratio is 99%. He was fabulous. I don't think any other attorney in the United States comes close to that. She wondered if the chief picked up on her sarcasm. I don't know anything about him numbers, but he was a good and righteous man. Rissa wanted to throw up. I assure you, the chief continued, whatever he's done after leaving here has nothing to do with us. I'm sure you're correct, sir, but I'd like to come out there and look through the Alvarez evidence and talk with the detective on the case if possible. Detective Belladonna, ma'am. She wasn't going to correct him. He continued, that case was open and closed. The jury was unanimous. The boy killed his parents for the insurance money. Mays's brows flew upward. She knew what he was thinking. Money. He was a teenager. He probably didn't even know there was an insurance policy. Mays met her eyes and frowned. Seemed he didn't believe the money motive either. And the detective working that case retired a few years ago. I doubt he even remembers that event, it was so long ago. And if there's no new evidence, the case is going to stay closed, Miss Belladonna. It's Detective Belgrande, Chief. Yeah, whatever. Unless you know the whereabouts of the boy, since he's an escaped convict, I don't think you'll get much out of coming out here. Well, thank you very much for your assistance, Chief. She hung up and looked up at Mays. What do you think, he asked. I think we need to contact the detective. Sounded to me like he didn't want me there. She turned back to her computer and typed in the detective's name she remembered from the file. Several articles came up, one had a contact email for him. She sent him a quick email with her info. Sitting back with a sigh, Rissa looked at her watch. It was only 10 o'clock. Felt like 5 page M. Before she could even take a break for the ladies' room, her phone rang. Detective Belgrande, I'm Simon Bloom, detective on the Alvarez case. Damn. That was fast. If she got this type of response to the case after 20 years, she wondered what she and Mays were in for. Thank you for contacting me, detective, she answered. I retired several years ago. Please call me Simon. How can I help you, Detective Belgrande? I'm interested in the Alvarez case you handled many years ago. I was wondering if I could ask you some questions. A sigh reached across the line. She readied herself for the same reaction the police chief gave her. I don't want to talk about it on the phone, he commented. Can I meet you somewhere? A restaurant or bar. After a moment, he said, There's a diner south of here that we could meet at. He gave her directions and said he'd give her an hour. Hopefully, this was the break they needed to get to the bottom of Lupin's injustice. Chapter 24 Mays. Mays sat in the passenger seat while Rissa drove the to meet Detective Bloom. He remembered the man's face from the interrogations all those years ago. That was so long ago, though. Would that man remember him? Mays had been heavy set as a teen shifter, and as an adult, he was lean with a shifter's muscular build. His face had slimmed, and his light hair was now dark years ago. He was fortunate this was something he could help quick with. His own father was abusive, and his mom could do nothing about it. Quick's parents accepted him into their home, and treated him as their own. Without that, he would have run away and wound up on the street. Turned out, he and Quick ran away in the end, from murder charges, but the situation was different than he would have ever thought. Okay, Rissa said, we have an hour before we get there. Tell me everything you remember about what happened that night. Mays wiped a hand over his face. Was the air conditioning on? He moved the vents to blow directly on him. That night, Something he'd tried not to think about for two decades. 
Rissa was right when she thought the photos were bad. But the actual scene was beyond words. For years afterward, nightmares of the tragedy plagued his mind, keeping him from sleeping. How long now would it take to repress those images? Earlier that night, Quick's mother had supper ready, and they ate without Quick's father, which had become the norm. Over the years, his father stayed later and later at the bars. Recently, he'd started coming home smelling of booze and always angry. After dinner, Diane surprised the boys with a cake for Quick's 16th birthday. They sang to him, despite his loud objections. Funny the things one remembered when tragedy hit. Several pieces of cake and ice cream later, he and Quick went out. Shifters were creatures of the night, until midnight anyway, when they needed to be home to get up for school the next day. Only a few people were in the park. The arcade was overrun with kids, meaning those under age 16. He and Quick were pretty much adults at that point. If he'd known what was to happen shortly, he would have wished for childhood much harder. Walking through the front door to Quick's home, his mother's scream greeted them. They hurried in, slid to a stop in the kitchen as they watched his parents circling the dining room table. His mother's shirt was bloody and torn. His father's eyes were feral with no human emotion except fury. Quick's mother yelled for the boys to get out of the house. She didn't want them to witness the violence. Twenty years ago, cell phones were not readily available, but there was a landline in the kitchen that Mays picked up to call 911. Quick had jumped on his father, and the man slung him into the wall like the teen weighed nothing. Quick got back on his feet and set into taking down his father. There was no comparison between an adult shifter, a teen shifter. When Mays glanced at the dining room, he saw Quick's father launch himself over the table. In the process, Quick was thrown to the side, crashing into chairs. At that moment, Mays saw Quick's mother gripped a butcher knife with a little blood on it. Quick's father crashed into his mother as she slashed the weapon outward. Blood spattered on the curtains. With the couple on the other side of the table, Mays couldn't see what was happening. Next thing he remembered was Quick ramming a knife into his father's back as his mother scratched at the fingers around her throat. His father reared back, shoving Quick toward the kitchen, then came after him. Banging came from the front door, and Mays ran to let the police in. He guided the officers to the kitchen where Quick stood panting over his motionless father, knife still in his hand. Quick's parents, Diane and Martin, were both dead. Blood was inching along the white tile like a blob creature devouring the floor as it spread. Red wetness covered Quick's clothes and hands. Fur along his arms and cheek had popped out. The police yelled for Quick to drop the weapon, then tackled him to the floor. Mays couldn't comprehend why the police were attacking his friend. Why were they cuffing him? Stuffing him into the cage constructed to hold shifters. Mays paused. The time after the arrest became a blur for him with talking to the police, the media frenzy, having to live with his parents again, all the whispers and gossip at school. Then came the trial where more lies than truth came out. He remembered how powerful Lupin was during that time. The man controlled the room and riveted all within. Everything he presented to the jury made sense evidence-wise, but it wasn't what happened. Rissa asked, did you not testify on the stand? Mays shook his head. No. I was told no one would believe what I said. They would think I was lying for my friend. Rissa scowled but didn't say anything. The trial was short. The attorney on Quick's side didn't do anything, it seemed. It was surreal. The jury came back after a couple hours with their verdict. Rissa said, that being guilty right? With death sentence? Yeah, Mays replied. My friend was to be hung the next day. The car jerked with Rissa's reaction. Hanging? The next day. She weaved back into their lane. What about appeals and such? Death row? That sort of thing? Not allowed in the shifter world, Mays answered. Once found guilty, punishment was swift. Same in the vampire world, too. That's why they took out Lupin. He was found guilty and justice was served. They'd have let the human world sentence him, but justice would be meted out by the shifter world. Quick is alive and well, so what happened? Rissa asked. Mays shrugged. I did what I had to. 
That night I sprayed myself with scent block and knocked out a guard at the jail and freed quick. Rissa sighed. I hate that you did that, but in the situation, it was called for. He smiled. So you aren't going to turn us in. Rissa didn't smile. As a law enforcement agent, it would be my duty to uphold the jury's decision. Oh shit. Chapter 25 Rissa If Rissa had been doing anything but driving, she'd have been rolling on the floor, laughing. You should see your face, she said between gulps of air. I'm just joking, Furball. She reached over to smack his arm. I'm trying to cheer you up. After the story of his and Quick's past, she needed something to keep her from sliding into the darkness of fury from the injustice. She became a police officer to protect those who couldn't protect themselves. Quick had been one who needed someone to stand up for him. He was too innocent to understand the world of conniving adults. Her heart broke that Maze and Quick had their childhood stripped from them. She couldn't blame Quick if he was sour to society. B. He didn't seem to be that way. She thought of the joke Quick pulled that scared the shit out of her when she was on the island the first time. The GPS on her phone instructed them to turn at the next corner, and their destination would be on the right. Just in time for brunch. Walking through the diner's door, she scanned the room, as was her habit. Immediately, she caught the eye of an older gentleman. How she knew this was their man, she didn't know. Maybe it was the way he anxiously stared at the door from a secluded spot toward the back. Or the hardness in his face from all the years of dealing with the underbelly of society. She headed toward him. The man's eyes fixed on the shifter following her in. Did he recognize Mays after all these years? When they reached the table, he got to his feet to greet them. Detective Belgrande, it's nice to meet you. He reached out to shake her hand. Thank you for talking with us, she replied. Detective Bloom's eyes returned to Mays. You're the Turner boy. They shook hands also, Mays looked pale and worried. I remember your scent. Otherwise, I wouldn't have recognized you. That sounded strange to her ears, until she recalled what Mays told her about shifter abilities. He gestured for them to sit. Would you like coffee? That would be great. She noted he had a soft drink, and if her nose was correct, quite a bit of liquor mixed in. Was this what life on the force did to a person? The old detective looked at Mays. So, I guess your disappearance along with Quick's wasn't coincidental. Mays frowned and turned his eyes away. I didn't think so, Simon continued. But nobody could prove anything either way. After a while, folks just assumed what they wanted. I'm glad you did what you did. Mays turned back and met his eye. You are. Simon nodded as his eyes darted to newcomers entering the diner. Your friend was innocent, as far as I could tell. He didn't deserve what he got. The waitress approached with coffee carafe in hand. After her cup was filled, Rissa ordered a sandwich. Breakfast seemed like ages ago. Thoughts spun in her head about the trial. So you're saying this case? I'm saying the boy was innocent, and whatever the hell Lupin did to secure the win was unethical and probably illegal. Simon sipped at his drink. If that bastard had planned on sticking around, I would have quit the force sooner than later. What do you mean, she asked. Jeffers Lupin had been a prosecutor for a long time. People like us, he motioned between him and Mays, clearly meaning shifters, live a long life. A couple years after this case, Lupin up and left. I couldn't have been happier. Why's that? Mays asked. Because that man was crooked, Simon continued. Money passed under the table constantly with everyone involved, the chief, judges, defense lawyers, whoever. Did you know that most of the jury were friends of the defendant's father? They were his drinking buddies. I interviewed each one of them before the jury was ever selected. The boy had no chance. Lupin set it up nice and tight. What about the physical evidence? Rissa questioned. The photos clearly show two different knives used. Why is there only one in evidence? The one Quick used? Simon shrugged. Don't know. A second knife wasn't found. 
other evidence for the boy's innocence went missing also. Convenient. Yeah, May snorted. Every step of my investigation was met with a roadblock. Problems I had to work around or solve in order to move forward, Simon said. The waitress returned with food, and Rissa used the time to think through everything. What was Lupin's endgame? What would he get out of a teenager being framed for murder? All I have to say is that I'm glad Karma caught up with the bastard and took care of him. May he rot in prison, Simon mumbled. Rissa glanced at Mays the same time he glanced at her. Simon must have noticed. What? Simon queried. She nodded to Mays and took another bite of her sandwich. Turns out Lupin screwed over a group of vampires and they tore him apart a couple days ago, Mays clarified. Simon sat wide-eyed for a moment. Even better. Simon, Rissa said, who do you think is guilty of killing the parents? This may prove or disprove Mays's story. She hoped it was the truth. She wanted to believe Mays was honest with her. Simon ducked his head and looked around at the patrons again. From what I can tell, I believe the story the boys told. It matches the evidence there and not there but should be. What about motive, she asked. Simon nearly spit out the gulp he'd just taken. Give me a break, he grumbled. What the hell is a 16-year-old going to do with that much money? A lifetime's worth of video games? So, you knew about the life insurance policy? She questioned. It came to light accidentally, he answered. The annual bill came in the mail shortly after the incident. Without that, we wouldn't have known it existed. Lupin was all over that for motive. If Lupin was so bad, May said, why didn't you go after him? Because I was told if I wanted to keep seeing my loved ones, I needed to stay out of it. Do my job and leave the lawyer stuff to them. I would have left then and there. But I thought if all the good guys left, how bad it would get here. Figures, Rissa thought. Typical for thug tactics. With her lunch finished, she wanted to wrap this up. Anything else you can give us? Just watch your back if you keep with this. Lupin wasn't the only one involved in a cover-up. Chapter 26 Maze The town of Haven was as quaint as it was when Maze left 20 years ago. Not much had changed on this side of town. If anything, it was more rundown. Talking to Detective Bloom the diner had memories from those horrific days coming back to him in more detail than he wanted. He remembered the panic from residents when human media got wind of the murder and bombarded their little oasis. He was sure someone would slip and let out their shifter secret and all hell would break loose. But everything turned out fine, concerning keeping the shifter race below the radar anyway. Rissa pulled into the police department's parking lot and steered the car into a spot. She turned to him. You want to stay in the car? I hadn't planned on coming here. I wouldn't have asked you to come if I did. No, he said, you need someone who knows the truth so you know who's lying. It's good that I'm here. She gave him a nod and opened her car door. Inside the front door, the reception desk was vacated. An officer came out and asked how he could help them. Rissa said they were there to talk with Chief Masterson. When the big chief shifter walked through the lobby door, Mays immediately recognized his face. More wrinkles and more weight but basically the same man. The chief stopped and looked Rissa up and down. A protective instinct rushed through Mays and he took a step forward in front of her, a low grumble coming from his chest. The chief took a step back, then recovered quickly and reached out a hand. Chief Masterson. How can I help you? Rissa pushed around Mays and took his hand. Hi chief. I'm Detective Rissa Belgrande from New Orleans. I spoke with you this morning on the phone. Instantly, the man frowned. He was not happy to see her. Rissa turned to Mays. This is my partner, Detective Turn. A streak of fear shot through him when he thought that the chief might remember who he was. The old detective at the diner was nonchalant about Mays breaking quick out of jail. But it was doubtful the chief would feel the same way. Rissa coughed and slapped her chest. Sorry. This is Detective Turnover. Mays raised a brow and rolled his eyes to her. 
Turnover. What was his first name? Apple or Cherry? He watched her fight a smile as she focused on the chief. A side door opened and an older blonde walked out. She was in civilian clothing, so he thought she might be the receptionist. As he studied the woman, she looked more and more familiar. I apologize for the sudden visit, Rissa said, but we were in the area and thought we'd stop by. The chief's frown deepened. I see. In the area, two hours from New Orleans. Rissa ignored the words and pushed on. Mays was impressed with her ability to be unflappable. Do you have a moment to speak with us? Before the chief could turn her down, she added, if we could just see the evidence, then we'd be on our way back to New Orleans. That's all you want, he clarified. To see the evidence. Unless you have footage of the trial, she said. Masterson shook his head. No video footage. Just newspaper accounts. The female at the desk spoke up. Sir, I can show them to the prop room and pull the box if you like. The chief scowled, not saying anything. Chief Masterson, Rissa said, there isn't a reason you don't want us seeing the evidence, is there? His eyes snapped up to meet Rissa's. May saw the gold of his animal wringing the irises. He stiffened, ready to spring forward if necessary. No, detective, he drawled. There is no reason except preserving the integrity of the evidence. He turned to the woman at the desk. Go ahead, Flo. He turned back to Rissa but spoke to Flo. Make sure everything stays intact. Flo stood from her desk. Yes, sir. She waved for Mays and Rissa to follow. They went through one door as the chief went in another. Mays bumped Rissa's elbow. When she looked back at him he mouthed behave. She smiled at him. She was in her element. She loved this. He loved that she was where she wanted to be. Rissa turned toward Flo. Wow, the chief seemed a bit grumpy. Flo waved it off. Nah, he's just not had lunch yet. He's grouchy when he doesn't eat. Mays breathed in the woman's scent. It wasn't familiar, but her face was. She pulled a ring of keys from her pocket and opened a door. Inside the room, shelves and cases held boxes, plastic bags, paper bags, clear containers and stuff. Everything was organized and placed neatly. Who takes care of this place? Mays asked. I'd not think so many years of material could look so well maintained. I agree, Rissa said. Whoever needs to come to our department for a while. Flo laughed. I'll take that as a compliment, she said. I've been here for almost 25 years. And in that time, I've logged in and carefully preserved every piece of evidence brought in. She rounded the counter, separating the entrance from the storage area. What case are you wanting? She opened a binder. The Alvarez, Rissa said. Flo paused a beat. That's an old one. From before I reorganized the room. She flipped pages in the binder. Let's see where I put that. She ran a finger down a column, turned a page, then stopped. There it is. She headed toward the back of the room. May suddenly felt sick. He was ready to puke all he had from breakfast. His legs were weak and sweat beaded on his forehead. What was wrong with him? Then a cool hand rubbed down his arm. Rissa stood inches in front of him, looking up at him. Her hands rested on his chest. You okay? She brushed her fingers over his forehead, wiping away the perspiration. He breathed in deep. His heart rate slowed and his stomach unclenched. Yeah, he said. I guess I'm bothered by this more than I thought. Her brows drew down, putting a crooked wrinkle between her eyes. Of course this would bother you, she said. You wouldn't be human if it didn't. He smirked at her words and she caught his meaning. Okay, maybe not human but you get what I'm saying. Thank you, he said. For what? Being here. Doing this for quick. For caring. Damn he was starting to get mushy. Like quick had gotten since meeting Vivian. Flo came around the corner. Here we are. Had to go way back to find these. She tugged the lid off the flimsy box and pulled out a yellowed sheet of paper, then scanned it. Let's see, she started, we got curtains with blood splatters on them, 
she pulled out a plastic bag with wadded up materials stuffed inside. A bloody knife with defendant's fingerprints on it. Her fingers gently placed the weapon in the sealed baggie on the counter. Then continued taking out items. Mace couldn't take his eyes from the knife covered in decades-old red stain. A flash of quick bent over his father's back, knife in hand while his father strangled his mother, played in his mind. It felt like a dream. More of a nightmare. He picked up the curtain bag and opened it. With the first smell, his mind immediately transported him to the dining room. A myriad of scents rose from the bag. The smell of pine and lemons that Quick's mom used to clean the house. The tang of smoke from the candles on the birthday cake that burned while they sang to Quick. A metallic hint from the dried blood, and a smell he'd never scented before. He took another breath and fixed on that odor. He couldn't place it, though it had vaguely familiar. Flo snatched the bag from him and sealed it. Please don't open or handle anything. We try our best to preserve all we can. Of course. Sorry, he replied. Flo asked, aren't you from New Orleans? Yes, Rissa said. How do you know? The receptionist's cheeks blushed. I overheard the chief talking about the Alvarez case this morning on the phone. That man's voice carries so far, he doesn't need a microphone to welcome the town to the annual July 4th picnic. Mays remembered those. What brings you city folk up here? Is there new evidence in the case? Have they found the boy? Flo quizzed. Actually, Rissa started, Lupin was arrested a couple days ago on trafficking charges and we're looking into his past. I think new evidence will shed a different light on this case. Really? Flo said. This case was a heartbreaker. How a boy could kill his loving parents like that was horrible. Rissa reached her hand back to squeeze his. That, and that alone, kept him from launching into a tirade at the woman. He schooled his expression and held his emotions in check. It wouldn't be good if Flo smelled his deep anger. Jeffers was so fantastic at the trial, she breathed, as if in love with the man. He took control of the proceedings, and led the jury to the correct verdict. It was a sad day when Jeffers decided it was time for him to find a better paying job. She sighed. With a great man like him, it was inevitable. It was hard to say goodbye. He caught Riss's subtle look to him. Yeah, Flo was looking a bit starstruck. Are you folks staying in town a while? She asked. Rissa shrugged. We'll look around. Maybe stay for a bit and talk to people. Mays didn't like that idea. He was ready to head back to the island where he could forget this horrible place and all that happened in it. If you want to talk to someone who was there, Flo said, you need to speak with my husband. He was one of the first people there, being family and all. He could tell you a lot. Both he and Rissa looked up at the woman. For different reasons. Rissa was probably interested because of an eyewitness account. He stared at the woman because he now knew who she was. Chapter 27 Maze Maze and Rissa sat at the one stoplight in the small town of Haven. I don't think you should have accepted Flo's invitation to their house. Maze, how was I to say no to Flo? She has cherry pie. She smiled. Besides, I really want to talk to her husband. Maybe he knows something that wasn't used in court, or something about his brother that would help us understand his state of mind. I don't know. He and Quick's mom didn't get along, Maze said. What do you mean, she asked. Do you know him? That woman, Flo? She's Quick's aunt. Her husband is or was Martin's brother. Why didn't you say something? Because I couldn't figure out where I'd seen her 20 years ago. She's changed a lot. A few too many facelifts or something. I remember seeing them in the courtroom, but I never met them personally. As I said, Quick's mom didn't like him. Why not? Rissa asked. I don't know, he answered. Quick never talked much about him. Did you catch Flo's use of Lupin's first name? Rissa asked, glancing at the rearview mirror. You'd think they were lovers the way she talked, Maze added. He noticed Rissa looking in the mirrors more than usual. She seemed fidgety. You okay? 
She sucked her lip in and chewed on it. Yeah, sorta. My senses are going crazy, she replied. You're what? He almost laughed. I sometimes get this feeling when danger is coming. It's kept me alive so I don't ignore it anymore. Maze looked around. Only a few people were on the sidewalk in this part of town. Cross traffic was heavy since the light just changed. He glanced in the passenger side mirror. A pickup truck was coming up behind them, but that was it. His eyes stayed on the truck. Seemed it wasn't slowing, maybe gaining speed. Rissa, May said. I see it. Her face was a mask of concentration. He watched wondering what he should do, and would he mess up her plan if he did anything. The truck was almost on their bumper. Hold on, she said as she floored it. Twisting the steering wheel to the left, she moved the front end of the car into cross traffic, slammed on the brakes, fishtailing the back end into a 180. This put them facing the other direction, in the opposite lane. The truck flew by in the lane they were in. Rissa stomped on the gas again to shoot forward out of cross traffic. They were driving in the direction they just came, but at least they were driving instead of sitting in a bashed in car with whiplash. Swerving into a parking lot, they came to a screeching stop. Each of them heaved a breath, knowing they could have just been killed. How the truck missed everybody else in the intersection baffled Maze. Rissa looked at him. That happened a lot around here. I can say I've ever experienced or seen that happen in my 16 years here. He glanced at traffic. That was awesome. Getting us into the other lane in the other direction. She winked. Part of cop training. After a moment of silence Maze asked, where are we going anyway? I thought about driving around town and getting a feel for it. But with that truck on the loose, I'm having second thoughts. How about we drive by Quick's home? Sure, he said. We need to get back in the lane we were in before the truck came along. She put the car into gear. Ready to try this again, she asked. Wait till the light turns green on our side, then pull out. Coming close to dying once was enough for him. He gave directions to his friend's home. All the sights felt eerily familiar, yet strange at the same time. The old neighborhood where the house was had gone to shit. Many of the buildings were abandoned and in great disrepair. Weeds grew tall in several yards and sun-faded swing sets rusted away. Rissa stopped in front of a once-cute white home with flower beds to both sides of the front door, filled with trash. The word murderer had been spray-painted along the side, and the windows were boarded up. They sat in silence, Maze lost in his memories, good and bad. Can we get inside? Rissa asked. Maze looked at and swallowed hard. Around back, there used to be a spare key hidden for the kitchen door. If it's there we can try. Rissa got out, prompting him to do the same. He schlepped through the weed-infested grass toward the driveway that led around back. From under the garden gnome in another flower bed, he lifted the key. It had rusted over the years but still looked usable. He slid it into the deadbolt lock and turned it. The locking mechanism shifted to the side. He opened the door and froze. Everything remained the same as he'd seen it when he walked out with the police. Yellow tape cordoned off areas where the bodies once lay. On the faded linoleum floor, a puddle of red-black blood had dried and cracked. Nobody had cleaned up. The dishes from their last supper still sat in the sink. Chocolate frosting clinging to the desert plates. A spatula sat next to a pan on the stove, ready for use. Look, Rissa said, drawing him from the past. She pointed to the butcher block that held the sharp knives Quick's mom used. Two were missing. A wide knife and a narrow one. Why hadn't anyone noticed that back then? Maybe they did. The old detective's words at the diner came back to them. If I wanted to keep seeing my loved ones, I needed to stay out of it. The dining room looked like a hurricane passed through. Chairs were smashed and scattered, the table was partially destroyed, dishes in the china cabinet behind the table lay broken where they fell. There were the blood splatters on the walls and sliding glass door where the curtains once hung. He recalled how Diane whipped the butcher knife across her husband's chest as he lunged over the table to get at her. Martin took the knife from her, 
and stabbed her several times before Quick took it from his father's hand and began beating on him. He'd forgotten that part of the night. The last place he remembered about where the knife had been was by Diane's body next to the door. As Mays moved toward the glass sliding door, the floor where Diane last lay came into view. Same as the kitchen, the place remained true to that last night. He turned away, not wanting to relive any more when he picked up a hint of the strange smell on the curtains in the evidence bag earlier. Moving closer to where Diane's body had been, the scent became stronger. But it concentrated at the glass door. What the hell? The door had been boarded up like the windows. On a whim, Mays hooked his finger around the bottom of the door handle and pulled. The door slid open with some effort due to its long period of non-use. Hey, Rissa called out behind him, you shouldn't touch anything. Using the back of his hand, Mays pushed the door closed. Did you unlock that? she asked. Nope, that's how it was. So, was it unlocked before the murder or after? Very good question. Mays took another deep breath. You smell something? Rissa asked him. She stood behind him, looking around. How can you possibly pick up a scent from that long ago? Easy, he replied. There's been no air circulation inside and the windows are boarded. No one's been inside to clean or anything. Everything that was here that night is basically still here. Not as strong but evident. Why hasn't someone cleaned up and sold the house? The stench of death is now part of the home. No shifter would want to smell that every day. That makes sense, she mumbled. I've seen enough. Let's go to Flo's. You ready to get out of here? May spun around, headed for the kitchen. More than ready. Chapter 28 Mays Back in the car, Mays watched as Rissa typed the address Flo gave to her home. He noted it wasn't the same street that he remembered them living on. They must have moved, he said. Yeah? That address you entered is on the ritzy side of town. Growing up, they were far from that. I remember Quick once saying that his mom was mad at his father for lending several thousand dollars to his brother. Was the brother able to pay it back? I don't know, he answered. Maybe that's part of the reason she didn't like him. Do you remember where Flo used to live? They lived on Wolfson Street. I might recognize the house if we drove by it, he said. Is it far from here? Sorta. But it's on the way to Flo's. Rissa typed in the street name on her phone GPS and they were off. What else do you know about the aunt and uncle? Rissa asked. Mace thought back. Not much. I saw them in the courtroom and at the house that night. They were among the first people there. I recall them talking with the police when my mom picked me up. They seem to be all right. I think his name is Robert, maybe Rodney. Anyway, they came across as a normal couple. What did Quick's father and uncle do for a living? Rissa said. His dad worked at the factory as most of the town did. His uncle didn't though. I'm not sure what he did. But I remember Quick telling me his dad and uncle were always coming up with get-rich-quick schemes. That would explain lending him money. They had boxes of Amway stuff in their garage. They got into some stock market stuff, and then flipping houses on the weekends. Rissa knows the car down Wolfson Street. Stop, he said. That one. I think. The lot was surrounded in chain-link fence with signs saying condemned and foreclosure. The landscape had returned to the wild, covering the sides of the house and fence. Well maybe, Mays added. I remember the purple shutters when we came over for quick to drop off something. Pretty scary now, Rissa commented. Someone should tear it down. Agreed, he said. Turn right at the stop sign and that will get us to other side of town. How far is it? Rissa said. Not as far as Quick's home is from here. Rissa's lips pressed into a pale line. What? Mays queried. Her head tilted to the side. I was just thinking how the aunt and uncle could have been among the first to arrive that night at Quick's house if they lived over here. You said they were there early, right? He did. But he never thought about it. 
it seemed natural that family members would be there. Chapter 29 Rissa When the GPS stated their destination was on the left, Rissa's jaw fell open. Talk about exact opposites. This was not what she was expecting. Maze turned to her with brows raised. This is the correct address, right? she asked. He glanced at the piece of paper written on. Yep, this is correct. The two-story home resembled the White House with the tall front columns supporting a white balustrade. The neighbors' houses were similar. All shouted money. Which according to Mays, the aunt and uncle didn't have. When walking up the front sidewalk, Flo had the door open before they reached the entrance. The woman was friendly if nothing else. Welcome, welcome. Please come in. Flo stepped back and opened the door wide. The inside of the house was as nice as the outside. Whatever get-rich-quick scheme they used, it worked. Flo hugged Rissa like they were best friends and introduced Rissa to her husband Robert. She shook his hand and greeted him. Behind her, Mays stumbled coming through the door. She looked over her shoulder at him. He didn't look good. Was he ill, she wondered. Flo escorted her and Mays into a den with fancy furniture and a wet bar. On the coffee table, small platters with cheese and crackers and dainty cookies sat waiting for them. Her stomach growled. The sandwich she had for lunch was long gone. Would you like a drink? Robert asked Mays then turned to Rissa. Both passed with a thank you. Rissa wanted to get this going. She planned on driving home before it got too late. Before Rissa could think of polite talk to segue into what she wanted to ask, Robert crossed his arms over his chest and stared at Mays. Have we met before, Detective Turnover? Robert asked. You don't seem familiar, but your face reminds me of someone I once knew. I never forget a face. Rissa about shit. She had no idea how much of an actor Mays was or how he'd handle this. I don't believe so, Mays said with an expression like he was thinking, unless you've been to New Orleans. I've been there most my life. Flo lifted her hand. Oh, we have been to New Orleans twice in the past several years. Mays gave that panty wedding smile. I'm always out and about. You must have seen me. I've worked a lot of public events, too. Robert slid his hands into his pockets. That must be it then. He stepped toward the bar. Rissa relaxed with Mays passing that test. She was impressed with how cool he was. Maybe he would make a good partner. Mays leaned over to her. I need to talk with you a second, he said. Flo took that second to interrupt. Detective Belgrande, you want to ask my husband any questions about the night his brother was killed? Rissa nodded then whispered to Mays, give me a minute here. Flo turned to Robert. I mentioned the detective wanted to talk with you, didn't I? Robert looked a bit pale. He was probably not happy recalling that night. Maybe she could work into the quasi-interrogation more casually. Robert, Rissa started, we met Flo at the station. What do you do? His eyes darted toward his wife then back to her. I'm a contractor, he said. I work from home usually. Rissa knew he couldn't lie without Mays smelling it. She glanced at Mays and he made a small nod. Mays asked what kind of contract work. I'm looking for something I can do from home. I'm not a morning a person. Robert smiled. I do consulting. He focused on Rissa. What questions do you have for me, detective? Oh wait dear, Flo said. I want to serve pie before we get into all that sad stuff. Flo stood. Come help me in the kitchen, sweetie. She turned to Rissa. You two wait until you've had this fabulous pie. It's my mother's recipe. We'll be right back. Mays grabbed her forearm. She waited for the couple to leave the room before she asked him what was so important. What do you need to talk about, she asked. It's him. He's the scent I recognize, May spit out. She was a bit taken aback by his aggressiveness. What are you talking about? What scent? The one at the house. The scent of the curtains in the evidence room. Hold on a second, Rissa said. 
She needed to wrap her head around what he was saying. You're saying you smelled Robert on the curtains in the plastic bag you opened this morning and at the house. Why didn't you tell me about this earlier? There was nothing to tell. It was just a scent, he said. So what does this mean? Rissa asked. I don't know. He rubbed a hand down his face. Rissa was worried about his paleness. Well, let's think it through, she started. If his smell is on the curtains, that means he was at the house sometime that day, right? Okay, yeah, he said. When, though? Before the murder, or during the time of it? And why? Quick and I were home all day until right after dinner, May said. If he was there, it had to be after we left and before we got home. She tapped her finger on her chin. Years of living inside criminals' minds had taught her to think outside the box and to never assume anything. You said when you and Quick came home, you heard his mother screaming and you went to the dining room and kitchen. Yes. Could there have been anyone else in the house you didn't know of? She asked. Mays opened his mouth then closed it. We didn't look around. If there were, wouldn't they be helping Diane get away? Rissa shrugged. If his smell was strong on the curtains, it had to be close to the time of the murder, or it would have been swept away in the circulating air in the home. That's what you said, yes? He nodded. Exactly. It was strong on the curtains in the plastic bag, so it had to be almost the same time. That would also explain why Robert and Flo were at the house so early. They were already there and had gone in or out the dining room door. But why, she questioned. The sound of shoes on the hardwood floors in the hallway brought their discussion to an end. Act normal, she told Mays. Here we are, Flo said in a sing-song voice. She carried a tray with four saucers of pie, and Robert brought in a tray with glasses filled with a dark liquid. I poured us tea too. Thank you. You should have gone through all that trouble for us, Rissa remarked. No problem, Flo said as she handed Rissa a plate and fork, we seldom have guests anymore and I do miss entertaining. She handed a plate to Mays, but he held up a hand, politely refusing the sweet snack. Are you sure, Detective Turnover, Flo said. How about a glass of sweet tea? Rissa figured he had no appetite thinking about what they just discussed. She, on the other hand, was famished and would eat his piece since he didn't want it. Cherry was her favorite. Detective Turnover, Robert said, while the ladies eat and chat, I have something that might be of interest to you. Robert started out the door and Mays followed, after a glance at Rissa. Well, crap. So much for getting the interrogation started. She took another bite of pie, using it as an excuse to think a moment. In her head, she played out the scenario of the murder, where each person was and what they did. Then other facts crowded her mind. Flo, Rissa said, you have such a beautiful home. I have to say, I'm so jealous. I've lived in a three-room apartment for ten years. This is so nice. Thank you, Flo replied. I've always wanted a big house with comfortable things. We've been here for almost twenty years, and I plan on staying until my last breath. Rissa coughed when hearing how long they'd lived in the house. She'd heard that same length of time over and over today. Flo handed her a glass of tea. Here, dear. Are you okay? Rissa swallowed a couple gulps of the extra sweet tea and almost grimaced. It was thick and filled with sugar. She set her half-empty pie plate on the table. If you would excuse me for a second, I need to make a quick call to my boss to let him know we're going to be a little late getting back. I'll be one second. She had an epiphany with her brain going into a sugar overdose. And if she was right, this would be over soon. Stepping outside, Rissa closed the door behind her and pulled her cell phone from her pocket. Pulling up the phone log, she redialed a number used earlier and waited for Simon to answer. Simon, hi. It's Rissa Belgrande with a New Orleans PD call again. Do you have a second? Sure. What you got? Who was the beneficiary to the insurance policy, she asked. That was the son. The prosecutor used it as motive for the killing. Usually when an underage child receives something like that, 
there is a guardian who takes care of things until the child reaches 18, she stated. Usually, yes, Simon agreed. So, in the case of Quick Alvarez, do you know who was assigned guardian, and was there a second beneficiary if Quick had died? The guardian was the father's brother. I don't remember his name. He was the second beneficiary also. How much was the insurance for anyway? Two million. A lot, for twenty years ago. Why do you ask? Because I just figured out the motive. Lupin was right about the money, but he pegged the wrong persons. And on purpose. Thank you, Simon. She pressed the end call icon and headed back inside. When she reached the front door, she felt a little lightheaded. She needed to eat something more than cherry pie to keep up with physical demands. Stepping back into the den, Rissa was met immediately with Flo, who was handing her the plate of pie. Here you go. Eat up before it gets too cold. Cherries are much better when they are hot. Don't you think? Rissa agreed, but her stomach was starting to churn. Probably from sugar overload. She took the plate and sat on the sofa, placing the pie and her phone on the table. Perhaps a slice of cheese and a cracker would calm her stomach. From somewhere nearby, a distant loud voice startled her. Maze was yelling. Where were Maze and Robert? Rissa quickly stood and regretted it. The room spun and she lost her balance. A hand grabbed her arm. You just lie down here on the sofa, dear, Flo said, guiding her to the cushions. Everything is going to be all right. Rissa's world went dark before she could even move her arm. Chapter 30 Maze Maze followed Robert out of the den and into the hallway. He wasn't sure what Robert could have that would be of any interest to him. Then again, maybe it would shock the shit out of him. Rissa had said she'd come to the conclusion Robert was in the house very close to the murder time. How could he get answers without giving himself away? So, he said, what type of contracting do you do? I didn't catch it before. They stepped into the kitchen. Would you like a beer? Robert asked. Nah, don't touch the stuff, Maze replied. Robert opened the stainless steel double-sided fridge and pulled out a cold one, popping the top. In a single swig, he downed half. Maze wondered if this was normal for him. So, Robert started, Flo says you have new evidence in my brother's murder case. We already have the killer, but he escaped. Unless you have Quick Alvarez, what other evidence would there be? Well, getting around to the topic of discussion was easier than he thought. Several days ago, Jeffers Lupin was arrested and spilled a lot of things, May said, and none of it a lie. Lupin spilled his guts, blood, and everything else in his body when the vampires got to him. Robert visibly paled, then guzzled the rest of the drink and tossed it in a bin. Come on out to the garage, detective. I think you'll appreciate this. Robert threw a door, switched on the garage light. Maze was impressed. The space was four spots deep with the first two lit up. Under the light sat a long work table decked out with woodworking gear, and a partial cabinet in the process of being made. You work with handmade wood items. Maze strolled around the table. Along the wall, Pegboard held every tool a carpenter could ever want. Heavy power tools were either on the table or a shelf. He noted two air compressors. One powered a nail gun lying on the table, and the other line was attached to an impact wrench. The man had some serious shit going on here. So about that evidence, detective, Robert cleared his throat, does it clear my nephew of killing his parents? I can't see how it would. Jeffers had a very tight case. Everything pointed to the boy. It does, Maze confirmed. Everything that was shown during trial. But there are several things not related to the jury. He watched Robert's reaction closely, looking for nervousness. Really, Robert said with fake interest. Like what? Like there were two murder weapons. Two knives. Robert fell against the table on the other side. He played it off like he meant to lean against it. Are you serious? How could that have gotten by the police? May shrugged. That was a long time ago. Who knows? 
Behind him, he heard Robert moving around stuff on the table. From the corner of his eye, he saw the air compressor line pull forward. That could mean only one thing. May snatched up a three-foot piece of plywood as a shield while dashing toward the cars. He felt the thud of each nail as they slammed into the wood. He dove to the side of the car. Robert fired another nail, busting the driver's side window before embedding in the leather seat. May scooted to the rear of the car. He checked underneath to see if nails could slide along the concrete and hit him. If Robert put the nailer on the ground, a nail could travel under the carriage. He tucked his feet behind the tire. How far could he push this guy? So, you were in the house during the time of the murder, huh Robert? He paused to see if Robert would answer. When he didn't, he continued. You didn't by chance see that second knife, did you? Then it hit him. Robert must have taken the knife. He was at the sliding glass door where the curtains fell on the knife. He had to dig through the curtains to get to it, leaving his scent behind. But when? Neither Quick nor he saw anyone else in the house. They were in the dining room the entire time, wait, no they weren't. At the end, Quick and his father had stumbled into the kitchen, clawing and fighting and stabbing until the end. That would have been plenty of time for Robert to make his escape. Holy shit, May said, you did take the knife. It was all Flo's fault. She made me take it, Robert shouted. His voice was much closer than earlier. Mays rose to look over the trunk of the car. The man had gone as far as the air compressor line would let him. That was 15 feet away, but close enough that a nail would hurt like hell. Mays crouched walked around the truck in the other spot to get some distance. Close fault? What has she got to do with the knife? he asked. She made me go back for the knife. She set the whole damn thing up. Framed me, but the boy stepped in and her plan worked better. Go ask her, Robert shouted. I'd like to, but you need to put down the nail gun first. That moment, Mays took notice of the truck in front of him, really looked at it. The vehicle's paint and body was the same as the truck that almost hit them this afternoon at the stoplight. That settled it in his mind. This guy was going down, his fault or not. No, Robert said, I'm not dying because of my asshole brother. He deserved what he got. He never loved her. Ah, this was interesting, to say the least. Your brother didn't love who? Maze asked. Beautiful Diane. He never appreciated her. Treated her like shit. Maze had to be careful here. The wrong question could ruin this whole thing. But you would have treated her better, right? He said. Damn right I would have. I loved her the moment I saw her. Then he came along and took her, not because he loved her but because I wanted her. The rage Robert felt for Martin came through loud and clear. Sibling rivalry at its best. What then Robert, he asked. Why did Martin kill Diane? Robert's voice was shaky. I don't know why he killed her. I don't know. Because I was alone with her in his home. Because he's a bastard who had it coming, and I hope he's frying in hell. Well damn. He didn't expect this. How could he turn in a person when they hadn't done anything but be near the person they loved? Mays understood the jealous protectiveness of shifters. Even though his own father beat on his mother all the time, when it came to others touching her, he'd kill whomever tried. Robert's words were muffled. I've missed her so much. To see her beautiful face through her living room window. Sounded like some serious stalking issues to Mays. No wonder Diane didn't like Robert. He was a bit creepy. Creepy kind of love. I gave her so much attention that my wife hated her, Robert continued. I'd never cheat on my wife though. She hasn't deserved my hostility over the years, but it is her damned fault Diane is dead. I'm tired, detective. I'm tired of the guilt weighing me down. Tired of always looking over my shoulder to make sure nobody found out what we'd done. I'm tired of staring at that box, knowing what's inside. Box? Maze rose, bringing his eyes over the hood of the truck. Robert faced the cardboard containers against the wall. What was in those boxes? Maze, Robert said, shocking him. Since when did Robert know who he was? 
Tell my nephew I'm sorry for how things turned out. He was the son I always wanted. And I would have been mine if that damn insurance letter hadn't come. Damned Lupin. May he rot with my brother. Before Mays could ask questions or move, Robert put the nail gun to his head and slammed in three with one automatic push of a button. Chapter 31 Mays Mays sat on the truck's front bumper in Robert and Flo's garage. Robert had basically confessed he knew the truth of the murder of his brother, even though he seemed to have played an unwilling part. Now he lay dead on the concrete floor, blood spilling from his head. He pulled out his phone and dialed 911. It was time to bring the locals in. He knew the chief was dirty, but there wasn't much choice right now. A dead body wasn't something you just walked away from. He waited as the phone rang. Robert said Flo had set up the whole thing. Whole thing being what? Suddenly, his shifter senses were screaming danger to him. That was just great. The threat to his life was dead, and now his animal was warning him? No, it whispered. Rissa. Mays was off the bumper and through the kitchen door, almost taking the hinges off in a heartbeat. What was happening to his partner? He skidded to a stop outside the den. Inside he saw Flo standing over Rissa, laid out on the sofa, eyes closed. Was she dead? That thought surged panic through him. Through the phone still in his hand, he heard the operator's tiny voice. 911. What is your emergency? Flo Alvarez, what have you done to Rissa? He demanded, rushing into the room, nonchalantly tossing the phone on the coffee table. Startled, Flo pulled Rissa's gun from the shoulder holster and pointed it at him. He froze, hands up. She'll be fine in an hour. She's just knocked out, as you should be if you would have eaten the pie and tea like I asked. Whoa, well, this was not the sweet, gentle Flo he left a few minutes ago. But if she set up the murder, obviously this was the true Flo. Mrs. Alvarez, why are you pointing a gun at me? Mays asked loudly, playing dumb. Because you're snooping too much. And stop yelling, she said just as loudly. Let the past remain as is. Everyone got what was coming to them. Even you? He asked. She laughed. Of course. I live in a beautiful house. Is the address 3301 Pine, he shouted. She looked at him funny. What the hell is wrong with you? She waved the gun at him. Sit down and shut up. Let me think. She paced a few seconds then looked up. Where is Robert? Mays sighed thinking about the body. He's still in the garage. Robert. Flo yelled causing him to wince. Robert. Get your lazy ass in here. Flo he won't be joining us or anyone. Not anymore. What are you talking about? The gun in her hands started to shake. What did you do to him? I did nothing Flo, but he told me everything about the Alvarez murder and how you and he were involved. He didn't know how truthful that was, but he'd go with it anyway. It was all his fault, she screamed. He smirked. Funny. He said the same thing about you. He's lying. Bastard. If he hadn't loved her so much, she never would have had to die. It was his fault. Martin was an idiot, and in the end, something was wrong with him. Robert told me how violent his brother had become. I was doing them all a favor. How were you doing a favor for the one charged with the murders? May shot back. An innocent was to be killed. Yeah, but he got away somehow, she said. No harm, no foul. Are you serious? He took a step toward her. He's had to hide his entire life. Others always hunting him for the bounty. People shooting at him, killing those around him. His life could have been hell. Flo had the gun pointed at him again. He gauged if he could rush her and take the gun without getting shot. She was a shifter too, but much older and probably not as sharp as he was on skills. Then the gun shifted to Rissa, lying on the sofa. You make any move and I will shoot her before you get a step closer to me. He stepped back, hands up. No need to shoot anyone, Flo. He kept backing away, toward the entrance. Where are you going? 
Flo said coming at him, gun up. Get back here. Hold on a second. I'm not going anywhere. He edged toward the hallway. It's hot in here. Just opening the front door. Using shifter speed he reached the door, opened it, and got back to the same place. Okay, I'll sit down now. Flo walked around him as he came back into the room. Are you stupid, she asked. Opening the door doesn't cool down the house. It's called air conditioning. Flo stepped out of the den, keeping the gun pointed at him. Maze grabbed Rissa off the sofa and tucked her under him on the floor. Drop the gun, he heard coming from outside. Flo pivoted, surprised by the voice, the gun still up. Several shots erupted through the door, knocking Flo into the hallway and onto the floor. Epilogue Rissa Mays flipped the steaks on the industrial-sized grill on the beach. Almost everyone on the island had gathered for a celebration. None knew it was to celebrate Quick's newly gained freedom, except those gathered around the picnic table. Quick and Vivian sat close, while the three lawyers from Wits and Wiz took up the other side. Sarah was on the beach, enjoying the surf. But I don't understand, Vivian said, what Flo could have said to make Martin want to kill Diane. Rissa jumped into the conversation. During the formal interrogation, she admitted to hating Diane because Robert had always loved her. Flo said she hadn't really planned it ahead of time, but saw the opportunity when it arose. The original idea was for Martin to kill Robert so she could be free of him. She had Robert deliver a birthday gift to the house, knowing Diane would be alone. Then Flo went to the bar to find Martin. She purposefully angered Martin with lies of Diane and Robert having an affair. That Quick was actually Robert's son and how much of a fool Martin was. That Robert was at the house right now with Diane. Alone. Rissa hated saying that part, wanting to save Quick any emotional turmoil. He seemed to be taking it well, but in private, it could be a totally different. Quick nodded. But when my father came in the house, he saw mom first and went after her. Yes, Rissa confirmed. Flo said she followed Martin home and was outside the dining room watching. Robert was walking out when she arrived. He was bleeding on the forearm. Not sure why Diane cut him. Quick snorted. That's easy. My uncle was always coming on to mom when my father wasn't around. He probably took advantage of the situation and pushed mom too far. She never liked him. Rissa and Mays shared a look. Mays had told her that. Vivian said, was that the reason Flo and Robert took the knife? Robert's blood was on the blade. That makes sense, Quick added. If Uncle Robert got the knife, he'd have to dig through the curtains leaving his scent behind. I can see that. The only thing Flo had to do was make sure all the evidence clearing quick disappeared. That was easy for her since she took care of the property room, Rissa explained. The attorneys on the other side of the table had been quiet until Mr. Wizen asked what part Jeffers Lupin played. Lupin's part was almost an afterthought, Rissa said. All because of the insurance policy that was due to be paid. Flo said Lupin was in love with her. In her dreams, Quick said. Yeah, she lives in her own world, Mays agreed. As I was saying, Rissa elbowed Mays, Flo thought Lupin loved her, so when he said he'd make sure the jury only saw the evidence that pointed to Quick if she'd give him half of the insurance money, she readily went along with it. That was probably a big chunk of what Lupin had swindled from clients over the years, Vivian said. Quick man, Mays said, you'd have a cow if you saw the house your aunt and uncle have been living in. A mansion with all the trimmings. They were set for life. Until the truth was found, May said, looking at Rissa. She blushed and shrugged. It's what I do, she replied. After what you guys did to help the women Lupin had kidnapped, it's the least I could do. We make a great team. Anne, one of the lawyers, popped the cork off the champagne bottle and poured several flutes. Vivian took her glass and stood. Here's to freedom for quick she winked at him, and to the two detectives, well, one detective and one pretend detective, who went to no end to have the verdict reversed in the court of law. Quick added, and to Skull Point. Our home. 
I hope you've enjoyed this latest production. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.